Dan and Mr. John, could you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this is the Planning and Zoning Board slash Local Planning Agency. It's an advisory board which makes recommendations to the county commissioners who will make the final decision on all these items. Items H3 and H4 have been automatically tabled by the applicant to the April 17th meeting. Items H8 and H10 are LPA items. Items on today's agenda will be heard by the county commission on February 2nd. When a motion ends in any kind of split vote, a roll call vote may be taken to ensure accuracy. As a reminder, each member who takes a motion, or who makes a motion, or a second needs to turn their microphone on so that your voice is on the record. Speakers for the public comment on agenda items will be given three minutes. At this time, if any board member has had any ex parte communication regarding any application, please disclose so now. All right, I need an approval for the PNZ minutes for November 14, 2022. A motion by John. Second. A second by Pete. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and the first thing is we need to vote, vote in a chair and a vice chair. I'll nominate to keep you as the chair. I uh, second that. We got a motion by Brian, a second by Pete. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed unanimously. We needed a motion for the vice chair. I'll make a nomination for Pete to be vice chair. <laughs> uh, I'm respectfully declined uh, as the vice chair, but I would like to nominate Ben Glover for vice chair. Second. Okay, got a motion by Pete, a second by John. All those in favor for Ben, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed unanimously. Okay, staff, if we could, I would like to move item 10 to the top, and we could start there, please. Yes, sir. So item uh, H10 is an ordinance amending Chapter 62, Article 6, Division 2, Section 62, 1157, submission of a binding development plan in support of a request for a change of zoning or conditional use permit. So the requested changes that staff is proposing will do three things. The first one would require that an application for a binding development plan identify all legal and equitable owners of the property and any entity with interest in the property, including but not limited to any lien or lien ors. Number two is re uh, require that all legal and equitable owners of the property and any entity with an interest in the property, including but not limited to any lien or lien ors, be party to the BDP prior to final approval by the Board of County Commissioners. And staff is seeking um, the board to clarify when the 120 day period to record a BDP uh, begins. Okay, do we have any questions for staff? Yes. Mr. John. Okay, uh, I have a few issues with the BDPs in general, and I wanted to bring it up at this session. Um, first of all, the, the ordinance states that a zoning change can remove a BDP. It's one of the requirements where a BDP can be removed. That means it takes all the teeth out of a BDP. If you have a new buyer, new purchaser of the property, and they come in and they want to change the zoning, then they can automatically do away with the existing BDP. Now, the BDP has certain requirements in there that were developed over time by either um, going before the zoning board before and neighbors raising issues about problems that they have, and so they set up stipulations. Now, we've got a couple of those today, 
uh, that we're going to go through. And I think it's important that if we have an existing BDP, that we should consider what's in there, what the restrictions are, so that we can either agree to keep them or talk about why they should be taken away. Okay? Now, one of the comments that you're, you're stipulating in your three points is that the um, having stakeholders involved in signing the BDPs. What happens, this is a rhetorical question, what happens when a, um, a mortgage E holds a note for a property, the property is sold, but they transfer that mortgage to the new owner? What happens to the signat their signature on that BDP from the previous, if you've thrown the BB BDP out on the new zoning change? Kind of rhetorical, but. Billy, Billy's gonna go up to the, the dais to explain that. Okay. Well, I mean, really, I think you've hit the nail on the head of why this is kind of necessary. Uh, currently, the question is, is uh, is it binding to a mortgage holder? But by making them a party to the BDP going forward, that question should be answered. That, in, that the mortgage holder would have signed it, been a party to the BDP to begin with, and therefore it will, it will continue to run with the property. Okay, so, but if the zoning board to, and the county commission decide to do away with that BDP, what happens then? Well, at that time, the interest holders at that time will again still have to be a party to it, um, to any application to amend the BDP. So they could object to it? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the, um, on the second page, third page, where it has the whereas sections. On the second whereas, it says, we'll continue to run with the land regardless of disposition, including foreclosure. Similar thing. So, how can we, how can we give BDPs more, more teeth so that they aren't arbitrarily dismissed and stay with the land? Well, this is one of the mechanisms, part of the reason behind this ordinance is to do that uh, procedurally, mm -hmm. to ensure that all interest holders are party to the BDP and therefore, um, as, the, as the land evolves in the future, uh, there's no argument to be said that I, I was, as an owner of the property, I wasn't a party to this BDP and therefore it doesn't apply to me. Now, as far as other, otherwise, other than that situation, applications to amend BDPs, um, at the end of the day, it's up to boards like this and the Board of County Commissioners how, you know, how they want to consider amendments to, to BDPs. Of course, they can, they can choose to deny, just like any other zoning action, to amend the BDP. Mm -hmm. And the last question I have, what's, what's the cost, the application fee for a BDP? I have to turn to Jennifer on that one. The recording fee is $10 for the first page and eight dollars and fifty cents for each additional page okay so it's not a not a large expense except for the legal costs okay all right thank you mr chairman i got one i want to yes sir mr henry how come i was always under the impression that we made that part of the deed that it had a binding development plan. It is that, so, that way everybody <laughs> above board knew what was going on. It is recorded, absolutely. Okay. And that's what, and that's another part of this, is that the 120 day clock, right. it's not recorded until that application is done and accepted, given final approval by the Board of County Commissioners. Okay. So if, if it's not clear when that 120 day clock begins, there can be a quite a long okay. period until that BDP is recorded. And that's what we're trying to firm down so that that is on the record. So any interest holder or neighbor can find out that there's a so pending BDP on the property. Here. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions by the board?
Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. I'd like to recommend approval. I mean, recommend that we may recommend approval. And I'll this. second that. Okay. Now, staff, will we need clarification on the beginning of the 120 days for that. It's in the ordinance already. Okay. Of when and where. Okay, we got a Mr. Most Chairman, you have a public comment on that. Remember? Kim had a comment on the. All right, now I'm all messed up. Oh, we got to hold that motion okay. one second, Mr. Ron. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Wadsworth, members of the Planning and Zoning Board. My name is Kim Rosenka. I'm with the law firm of Lacey Lyons Rosenka. I'm here um, just because I deal with these BDPs all the time, and there are times where this ordinance becomes very onerous. I think this is going to make it worse. Let me tell you why. A couple reasons. First, when you talk about any lien holders, that could be a code enforcement lien. You're not going to get the county to sign off on a code enforcement lien. Could be a mechanics lien with a dispute with a, a supplier or, or someone who has provided materials. So the, the section H with any lien holder, it's just overbroad. It's too broad. And I would ask that you recommend that not be in there. I understand having the bank, the mortgagee, be required to sign, but the second part of this is I ha currently have a case, came before you, went through here, no recommendation of BDP, got to county commission, and one of the commissioners said, we want a BDP. The client who owns the property agrees, but now the bank won't sign a joinder. So we're trying to work through their legal department so that 120 days is a problem. This doesn't clarify the 120 days. It doesn't give any discretion going forward if we need an extension. So what happens? We have to come back and start the process all over. And, and the fee for a BDP is $849 to go through for just a BDP or removal. So there is a fee going through the process um, and a $300 natural resources fee uh, and the recording fee. So mm -hmm. I, I would ask that you all consider adding what's in your packet um, that the 120 days may be extended by the county manager or the county manager's de designee upon good cause shown, such as an inability to obtain the mortgagee's consent or joinder. The denial of an extension may be appealed to the county commission within 30 days. There has to be a remedy. Right now, we're kind of stuck. We're coming up against that 120 days because the county commissioner did it at a hearing. We couldn't go back to the bank and say, hey, and frankly, I've never had a bank say no. I've had a bank say, we've got to find the right person. So I just ask that you get rid of that lien holder because it's overbroad and that you would add a provision that that 120 day can be extended upon good cause. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Rosinka. You want to modify your request? She makes a good point, uh, two of them. Uh, I think that there should be uh, a way to extend the 120 days. Uh, but as far as getting rid of all the lien holders, I mean, they've got an interest in it, and it may be they may object to having the uh, BDP, for example, removed. Uh, or maybe they're very, very much in favor, but we need to know what they want. Uh, so I don't have a, I would, I would, I would say uh, let's provide some way of extending the 120 days because she's right, that may be a problem. Uh, but the other, that's, that's, that would be my recommendation. Can we table it? Can we table it until they readjust it? Staff, do we need to table this to get more clarification on that? Or as far as the 120 days and the extension? Uh, as, as long as we I think, can read that I, right I, in, I, I think w without talking to Alex, I think that you know <laughs> <laughs> that we we understand where you're coming from, and we can write the write some language in it or provide for an exemption or or meets the intent of what your potential issue is. Right. So this item still has to go to the board of county commissioners. So if your direction is to incorporate some sort of um, administrative process that we can increase the time, we can take that to the board. And make note of that in the agenda report. If that's your direction. But, Mr. Chairman, we won't see it until it goes to the county commission. So, I would I would prefer to table this until they come back with other language and we can do it at the next meeting. 
Well, the, the county commission will pick that up. Yeah, let, maybe. Let's approve it here and let the commission deal with it. Just they, they know how we feel. That's a suggestion. All right, Mr. Ron, you want to stay with your motion? Yes. Pete, with your second? Uh, I, 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 my second. Or I'm sorry, with Henry's second, with some clarification on the extension of the 120 days. Yes. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Okay, one opposition. All right, item H1. Good afternoon, board. Um, item H1 is Robert J. Woodhouse requests a change of zoning classification from GU to AUL. The application number is 22Z00059 for tax account number 2441057. It's located in District 1. Okay, is the applicant here? All right, sir, if you could state your name and address for the record. My name is Robert Woodhouse, Jr. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Robert Woodhouse, Sr. Um, the address is 3735 Detroit Street, Cocoa, Florida. And a little bit about what you're wanting to do. Um, we're wanting to put up a 1,500-square-foot a building in the backyard because uh, we have a 60-acre property in South Carolina, and we go back and forth. Uh, we need somewhere to, to store our equipment when we're down here for repair and whatnot, and then the extra vehicles. All right. Does anyone in the audience want to speak for or against this item? That's really good news. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing that, I bring it back to the board. Anyone have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I just want to ask if uh, you plan to do any ag tourism or any, are you going to sell any commercial property on, your, on, on this? No, sir. Or any, any commercial. Okay, cool. Thank no, you. No, actually, we're having a re zoned as agricultural light, I believe, so right. it's kind of just for the stipulation of the larger building. All right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I recommend, uh, move that we recommend approval of this. Uh, since it's an AUL, then I have no problem with that at all. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Ron, a second by Pete. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passed unanimously. All right. All right, sir. Now, that's still got to go in front of the county commission. Okay. Is have it? a good day. Okay, thank you. Okay, staff. Item H2. That could be H2? one of the day. Yeah. Michael McLean and Kelsey Barnes request a change of zoning classification from RR1 to AU. Application number 22Z00055 for tax account number 2802103, located in District 5. Okay, is the applicant here? If y'all could come up and at the microphone there, sir, if you could state your name and address for the record. My name is Michael McLean. I live on 2405 Maple Street, Melbourne, Florida, 32904. All right, and a little bit about what you're wanting to do here. Um, my wife and I would like to raise chickens uh, and breed them uh, with a few roosters to make hybrid chickens and produce eggs. Uh, we also want to get a couple goats as family pets and an alpaca for some wool and also family pets so we can have a family farm essentially. Homestead. Yeah, homestead and, of course, selling locally for the eggs. A lot of people like eggs around our area. <laughs> All right, hold on one second. Does anyone in the audience would like to speak for or against this item? Sir, if you could, if you could just step over to the side and sit back. Ma'am, you too. And, sir, if you could state your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Patrick Horn, uh, 2335 Maple Street, Melbourne, Florida, 32904. Okay. So it's not that uh, we don't want you guys to have your family farm. Uh, it comes down to the roosters. They had four on the property, and it, I live 
no, about 200 yards from their fence line, and it's like they're in your backyard. And I'm not so much affected as the immediate neighbor, uh, Brent and Sharon Dolan. Uh, I guess you had the uh, the box or whatever right on the fence line, and it just kept uh, really wearing them down. We've been there 31 years, and Brent and Sharon have been there 35. Raised our kids. We have the grandkids there. In fact, our grandchildren were in your backyard at a bonfire over the holidays so it's not a futile uh, situation it comes down to the roosters and four do you need four I don't think so do you need one no you don't you can go to tractor supply and buy them all day for a dollar a piece so so you're against this I'm, I'm against it and okay. I didn't know if there's an addendum that can be done where you could have uh, the other animals that you want but not roosters. I don't know if that uh, if that's a, an option or not, but you know, I mean it just comes down to the roosters. As I say, we've been there a long time, and okay, you know, we'll continue to be good neighbors. But uh, that's my uh, opinion. So all right, I would vote against it. Thank you, sir. All right, ma'am, would you like to speak? And if you could state your name and address for the record also. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brenda Piccarello. I live at 2470 Vermont Street in June Park. It's actually a coincidence. I'm one of their neighbors that live in the neighboring streets. And I'm actually for this. And this is why we're all here today. We, I actually used to own a house over in Heritage Oaks, which is located across the way from June Park. I lived in an association neighborhood. And I realized after a short time of being there that that was not for me. When I moved into June Park, this is exactly what I knew I was getting. Chickens. We have a pig that ran loose in our neighborhood just a few days ago. And we all help each other out. So I'm here and I'm for this because this is exactly why I moved to June Park area. And this is exactly why I live to Vermont Street and live on 0.85 acres. Is so I could have the freedom to have three dogs, four ducks, a, a cat, a bird, and chickens if I like. And so this is what we want to keep this neighborhood. And I'm, it just happens to be a coincidence that they're here today. And I want to say that I'm for this. And I hope you guys vote for it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, was there anybody else? Yes, sir. If you could state your name and address for the record. Yes, sir. Uh, Daryl Duran speaking on uh, behalf of Melvin, Melvin and Linda Duran. They uh, border my parents. My parents have donkeys. We got the horse farm next to us. We don't have a problem with Mom and Dad don't have a problem with it. They're good folks. You know, they got three acres, we got almost two and a half. The whole, this whole land where they're at and mom and dad are on was zoned agricultural back in the day. We're zoned agricultural, it backs up to them, it should not be a problem. All they right. had, and mom and dad's got goats and the donkeys. All right, thank you, sir. Yep. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Okay, if y'all would come back to the podium. And seeing that, I bring it back to the board. We have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, just wanted to ask if you plan on doing any ag tourism on your property uh, for, for this. Ag tours like a uh, uh, stable or barn? Like uh, you're going to go pony rides, for example, and, char and charge for Oh, it. Um, not at this time. Maybe long down the road once we're established, my kids get older, we might try to do a petting zoo, but that's like way out there. For now, we just want to do what we can on our own property as far as just having family pets and then the chickens so okay. she can breed them and sell them and then eggs for the community. All right. But, um, for, the, for the rooster aspect of it, um, are, are you opposed? Do you have to have four roosters or do you have to have a rooster at all, in all honesty? So we say three to four. She mostly breeds the smaller Saramas and the Bantams. Uh, right now we do have two larger roosters, which our neighbor took for us since we are in violation and can't have them at the moment. Um, on bordering neighbors. Yeah. Um, just an FYI, most of our bordering neighbors all have roosters. We had moved the coop temporarily over to the other side, right next to the other roosters. And um, Steve and Sharon Dolan still complained about the roosters at that time and blamed everybody else's roosters on us. So it wasn't just us, and it's not just us. Um, there's roosters all around the neighborhood. So if 
they can have roosters. I just don't understand why I wouldn't be able to and why specifically my roosters are the ones that are the problem. All right. And just to add on that, so the current coop is near the fence line because we had to go through a process of getting a fence, which was a bit difficult with the neighbor, unfortunately. I am building a new coop and they are now free range now that our property is fully fenced in. So they will no longer be just sitting there near their house. Actually, they never are. They're they, they, usually they flew the out anyways, other side. But, but um, yeah, it's, I don't feel like it should be an issue considering when my roosters go away, there's still roosters all around them. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a question for staff real quick. Uh, the Ag Tourism, uh, sorry, the, for, if they want to do a petting zoo, do they, do they need a conditional use permit? They would? So our code requires that a zoological park requires a conditional use. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, you did have the code violation. What, what was the violation itself? It was about the roosters. Um, I've had them for about three years. Um, we went through a little property line feud with the neighbor. Um, she owns the nursery next door to us. She zones, she, she borders our longest property line. And we had to, after we got a survey done, in order to install our fence um, to keep everything in, like my dog who got hit by a car once because we didn't have a fence. Um, and she did not like us cutting down trees. So it's how it all started. So this is over a long period of time. And um, when we wanted to purchase the property from his mother, she, made it, she did not want to sell it to us because of this neighbor. She's had a long history with her um, and issues with tree trimming, cutting down trees, clearing of land and all that. So um, she did not want to sell it to us. And her stipulation for selling it to us is that we had to get the land surveyed, cleared, and put a fence in. And it was a very long and difficult process um, because the neighbor decided that 15 feet into my property was hers. So it was a constant. So I've had these roosters for three years, and it wasn't until the trees were cut and the fence was placed that my roosters became an issue. Okay. Three years. And so we thought we were agricultural. We had no idea we were not until she called the code enforcement on us. But you're saying that the issue was on putting a fence in, not the rooster. Correct. It yeah. was putting a fence in because we had to cut trees down. And uh, she really likes trees. Um, she says they have souls. And um, when we cut them down, we're murderers. Okay. So she didn't care about the rooster? No, not initially. Okay. Because I read that and I thought maybe you had to kill the rooster or something. <laughs> No, 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 we, uh, we had rehomed them. So I had um, roosters, they bred with my hens, and then I ended up with a surplus of roosters, which I'm in several groups, and I was attempting to rehome them before the, the code enforcement violation. They're just, I don't know if people don't want roosters, so it's really hard to get rid of them because you know, there's not a lot of people around who have egg status anyways and can have them. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get rid of most of them, and then we have a few with a neighbor on a contingency that you know, they can keep them if they want them because they're assisting us, but if not, um, well, we, we need to get back onto this zoning yes, issue. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mr. Chair, are you ready for a motion? I'm ready for a motion. Uh, okay, I will uh, make a motion on item H2, uh, changing the zoning classification from RR1 Sorry. to AU. This is two, correct? Two, right. um, as I feel it is compatible, the properties next door and uh, just to the corner of it are um, compatible. So, motion. I'll second, second that. All right. Okay, we got a motion by Ben, a second by Brian. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passed unanimously. Good luck with your roosters. Thank you. <laughs> okay, staff, if everyone in the room, if you could please turn your cell phones off, it'd be nice because we're, this is gonna be a long, a long meeting, so. Uh, staff, we tabled three and four, so we're moving to item five, correct? Correct. correct. Item H5, Thomas Manuel Gillen Argeas and Elsa F. Rodriguez Ariega request a change of zoning classification from AU to RU1-9. The application number is 22Z00058 for tax account number 2419383, located in District 2. Okay, is the applicant here? Okay, if you could come up to the podium, sir, and if you would state your name and address for the record. 
Thomas Manuel Gillian Arguelles, 501 Brock Avenue, Crestview, 32539. And a little bit about what you're, why you're wanting to do this. Well, we just tried to put a house, 12 house, I mean, 1,200 feet, maybe three beds and a couple baths, that's all. But the reason is because it's a agricultural thing, I know. So we just try to change this in order to build it. the house. Here in Maryland. So you're just wanting to put one residential yeah, home? Exactly, one residential. Hmm. That is. Okay. We just got three years with the property. And we got two cleaning, I mean, clear out. <laughs> well, we just want to do more. All right. Is there anybody in the audience would like to speak for or against this item? That's good news. <laughs> Seeing that, I bring it back to the board. We got any questions for the applicant? I'm good. I've seen no issues with this. Consider it's all AU around it. So if nobody else has any questions, I'll make a motion to approve it. I'll second. We got a motion by Brian, a second by Pete. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good day, sir. Item H6 is Ronald Abbott and Abbott Manufactured Housing Incorporated request a change of zoning classification from BU1 with an existing BDP to BU2 and removal of existing BDP. The application number is 22Z00060 for tax account number 3010400, located in District 3. Okay, is the applicant here? If you could state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kelly Hyvonen with Land Development Strategies. I'm here representing Ron Abbott, who is the property owner. Um, the existing future land use in this case will remain at Community Commercial. And what we're seeking today is a request to rezone this property that you see in yellow from BU1 to BU2 for a desired future use of boat and RV storage. The reason that this site is a great location for that is because of its location to US-1, it's adjacent to railroad tracks, it is next to some vacant property, a Dollar General, some commercial retail activities, a religious institution, and mainly it is very close to Barefoot Bay, which you can see on the west side. Um, Barefoot Bay, they do have some on-site storage for boat and RV. However, they're 100% full and they have a waiting list. So we believe that they would be actually one of the biggest customers of this site for boat and RV storage. Mr. Abbott, the property owner, has spoken with the manager of the HOA as well as some of the residents, and they're seeking more nearby boat and RV storage. We are hoping in the future to obtain a letter from the HOA in support. It just hasn't happened yet because they haven't met in time for this meeting today. If we receive rezoning approval to BU2 on this site, um, we would proceed with due diligence and look at site planning for boat and RV storage. We haven't had any communication related to the rezoning with the exception of the conversations with the Barefoot Bay manager and some residents. This request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is in keeping with the character of this corridor. And with that, I can take any questions or refer to any other maps. Hold on one second, ma'am. Anyone in the audience want to speak for or against this item? 
seeing that I bring it back to the board we have any questions for the applicant it, yeah, yeah mr. chairman yes sir we usually historically have requested an applicant to meet with the subdivision or something there surrounding that do we want to maintain that consistency and I think the only reason that we had barefoot bay you know you get correct 3,000 people you know that's yes. my only thought we've we've sort of promoted that in a, you know we don't we don't keep that a secret but right yeah and we've reached out we've reached out to management um, they are outside of the 500 foot radius that would normally get notice of this of this meeting um, but we're expecting them to submit a letter for us to put in the record at some point um, in support of the change of zoning to be able to put in boat and RV storage here. And we're, we're open. We would have liked that letter too, because usually what happens to us, we'll have 4,000 people in here <laughs> telling us why did you all allow this to happen. So that's, that's my only reservation. That just Understood. Now, is there a reason you need to go to BU2 versus BU1? BU1 does not allow for the outdoor storage of boats and RVs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, you do intend for it to be boat and storage? That is the desire at this time, yes. That's what the market would call for. Would you be willing to put a BDP on it that says that you will, that's what you will do in, and exclude other potential BU2 uses? Because there are some BU2 uses that I think would, anyone would find objectionable. Mm -hmm. uh, the boat and storage may be fine, but uh, would you be willing to put a BDP to restrict it to just the boat and storage? It would be something I'd really want to confer with the property owner about, um, but that is the plan to do that, and if that's the only way to get through this, <coughs> boat and RV storage is really well, what they're looking to do. To get my vote, I would, uh, in, in affirmative, I would like to have that BDP. I agree with you, Ron, and also, Henry has a valid point. Um, since they are outside of the, the radius of where the notice was sent, it's almost might be a good idea to table the item, give them the opportunity to speak with the community, and then see if the BDP is something that your, your client would pursue. Would it be something we can move forward with a recommendation of this board to take care of those items before commission so we don't have to restart again? Is that doable? That's an item that the board, could, you know, to move forward or not. If you don't feel comfortable enough moving it forward without definitively having a BDP, that's your choice, and it's your choice to move forward without the letter from the uh, um, adjacent subdivision. That's really, you know, at the board's discretion. But if you do, if you, whatever decision that you do decide to, we can just if. We can table this application to the next uh, PNZ meeting, which would be about a month. It would not require it to be remanded back to staff review and have to be uh, re-advertised. So it'll be about a month delay if you so choose to uh, table this to get that letter and to get um, clarification from the property owner. Okay. Well, uh, that's where I'll stand. Uh, I'm not going to make a motion. I want to hear what the board has to say, but I. I I feel like that's the direction we should go. Mr. Chair, um, yes, I'm, I'm going to grant to Ron here on, on, on the BDP for, for, for this project. Um, however, I, I do believe that the Bay, Barefoot Bay does have a group of trustees that are elected representatives of group Barefoot Bay. Am I right? Am I wrong in, stand, in saying that? You're right. Yeah, yeah. I believe that's yes. how they're created. Yes, sir. Right. So I, I feel that, um, that we do move, move forward with this project with the BDP. Um, seems that everyone was notified within a 500 foot radius plus she did her due diligence on the on the storage facility seeing it was 100 percent full and at capacity so this is a need in the barefoot bay area um, and also i'm pretty sure the trustees would or would not know, would know that this was happening so um, I'm, I'm i'm okay with this project with with ron's comments um, and i'm willing to make a motion as such limiting the bdp to um, just boat and rv storage correct ron are you okay with that? Yes. Could I just have a minute to talk with the owner's representative? Go just on. really quick sidebar. 
Is that okay? You just we can race. adjourn for you, a couple minutes. You got a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just made a comment, but that was the direction I was interested in. But you know, if you 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 know Palm Bay better than anyone, so if you feel comfortable, they do have trustees there. That I feel like trustees would have shown up if they really had a problem with it. And then also, I don't see that it would be an issue. I just feel like, like Henry said, it's a respect thing. Okay, we are good with a BDP that limits it to boat and RV storage as long as everything allowed in BU1 is also allowed, if that makes sense. So, we don't, um, so if the BDP says you can have what BU1 allows plus this one use from BU2, that would make sense. Because what if they decided to go, we want a retail store, then do we have to come, you know what I mean? Um, it's BU1 now, so could you limit it to BU1 uses plus Mm -hmm. This other use in BU2. I just don't want to exclude things RV. that That's are less. That's not a healthy intense. BB DDP. That's you, now you're tying up everybody in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but well, because we don't want to. That's not a real healthy situation. <laughs> Make everybody else abide by their BDP. Wait, what? I guess that what I'm saying is. Maybe I'm not explaining this correctly. We don't want to exclude the lower intensity uses that are already allowed right now. You want BU2 zoning. Yes. yes, but if you only. Limited to boat and RV storage. With the ability to go BU1. Correct. With Mr. Chair, to have the uses if, if I can just interject. So, what the yes. applicant is asking for is to have BU1 uses with the inclusion of RV and boat storage only. Mm -hmm. So that would allow for all the BU-1 uses that are currently allowed on the property to remain with the addition of only the RV and boat storage that's allowed in BU-2. Correct. Right. Yes. Yes, we would be, we would be okay with that. Um, so for example, the property owner um, sold off a portion of that property in the past for the Dollar General that's there now. Um, market conditions can change like crazy. Um, but we're just looking right at this point for that one BU2 use in addition to the BU1. Mr. Chair, if I can just, so this already has uh, an existing BDP, so your motion should be to remove the existing BDP because it limits it to an uh, 55 and over community, so that condition for the BDP has to be removed to allow for the BU1 uses. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ball, can you tell me what the uses are in the BU-1? I don't have my list in front of me. What are the available uses for that? Uh, typically, it's um, office retail. There's uh, some very light manufacturing uses that are allowed. Um, no residential, as in multifamily? Already General retail, yes. You would be allowed to have residential if it meets certain criteria in our land development code and not our comp plan. What's but that? Not multifamily. It does allow for multifamily. Really? Well, the, the previous BDP had a restriction of no residents younger than 18 years old. That's a 55 and over community. I understood that, but it's that's what they wanted to do. But that restriction of the 18 year olds would affect if anybody wanted to come back on the BU-1 and have an apartment complex in there. That is correct. So how do you, how do you draw the line there with the existing BDP the way it's stated? Well, the BDP is a negotiation tool that this board has as long as with the Board of County Commissioners. If you um, are having some issues with any of those uses, you can limit those uses as far as what the BDP would allow for and what it doesn't. Okay, but can we carry forward 
than the restrictions that are in the previous BDP. No. Absolutely. No, he's saying, right. no, he's saying to remove it. Absolutely. Right. To remove it, but not can, not to carry forward any stipulations. You can do you can, can do either, right? you can do whatever you um, see fit as okay. far as allowing the uses that are currently allowed on the property and what uses that are potentially allowed in either BU one or BU two, however direction that you decide to go. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chairman? We still have your motion. We still have my motion, right? With the removal with, of existing? With removing the existing BDP and adding a new BDP that restricts the BU, that changes it to BU2 zoning, but restricts it to boat and storage. And that any BU1 zoning, that I mean any BU1 uh, allowed uh, projects she can do. Okay. But on, the only BU2 zoning uh, allow is the boat and storage. Correct. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Ron, a second by Pete. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes. Yes. We have two opposed. I'm sorry, it was Mr. Minibu and who else was opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item H7, NDA Merit Project Zenith LLC and SES Merit Project Zenith LLC request a change of zoning classification from BU1 and BU2 with two existing BDPs to PUD and removal of two existing BDPs. The application number is 22Z00062 for tax account numbers 2428002, all located in District 2. Mr. Chair, before I, I just want to provide some clarification for the board. So this item is a PUD request. This is not a typical request that we get. So with that, there is a preliminary development plan that is gets a, gets approved with the zoning action. So with that, uh, there are a couple uh, waivers that have been requested. Two of them are for setbacks um, to our code. Uh, based on staff's review, those were not needed. However, there was an additional waiver that was needed and that goes with the open space requirement of 25%. So just wanna make that part of the record in your discussions, because that is a waiver moving forward that they will need to have. In addition to this, there is a list of uh, potential conditions that is in the staff comments that um, um, if you so desire to include in your recommendation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Wadsworth, members of the Planning and Zoning Board. My name is Kim Rosanka with Lacey Lyons Rosanka. Here on behalf of the um, applicant, Woodfield Acquisitions LLC, Mr. Ross Abramson is the representative of Woodfield Acquisitions LLC. He is passing out for you a rendering and also re a revised PDP with the additional waivers that are needed. Um, and I'll discuss those as we go through this. Um, Woodfield Acquisitions LLC is a subsidiary of Woodfield Development. It's uh, been in business for 17 years and has completed 70 luxury apartment complexes. Uh, Mr. Abramson is here to talk a little bit about the company and answer any questions specific to this development. Also here with us is James Taylor with Kimley Horn who did the traffic analysis and he can answer any questions you may have or anything that comes up. He's not going to bring a presentation but if you have questions he is here to answer questions as well. Um, also, Ken Good with Adkins Global. He is the engineer of record. What you have before you has been created by an architect. There was a prior engineer who is no longer on the project, Peter Gallo. So um, Adkins Global is taking over and will be working moving forward with the final development plan and the site plan if this is approved. We are requesting a change from BU1 and BU2 to BU PUD with a recommendation of approval of the preliminary development plan, which you have in front of you and removal of two BDPs which limited the specific commercial uses. This is on Fortenberry behind the Merritt Square Mall. 
It's the old paintball field and the old skate park. It's been vacant, it's been shut down, I think, since around COVID time. And it's been vacant for a while. It's also two undeveloped pieces of property. The PDP allows the flexibility in design and also allows us to work around two wetlands that will be preserved on this site. The plan is to have 370 luxury apartments with five buildings. The apartments are five floors with elevators, which will be 60 to 62 feet in height. There will be a clubhouse, a pool, and a dog park. Uh, Fortenberry Road is to the north. South Plumosa is to the west, and the two credit unions are also to the west. Harbor Woods Boulevard is to the east. Harbor Woods Condominium and, um, is to the south. There are two-story condominium. And there's a single family rental property to the south um, owned by Mr. Cohen. The revised PDP in front of you shows three waivers. One is a waiver to the 25 foot reduction um, in the two to one setback requirement along the south interior property line. The staff has said we do not need that, but a two to one ratio at a 60 foot building is 120 feet, and we only have 95. So we are still asking for a 25 foot waiver. If we don't need that at the final development plan, that will come out. But we believe with that two to one ratio necessary that that is uh, something required. We're also asking for a reduction of 1.1 acre in the open space requirement. And that essentially is because this property is a very unique size and it does have wetlands that we're intending to preserve. And we have the Veterans Memorial Park, which has many amenities that the residents of this luxury apartment complex will be able to use. So the open space requirement is not as necessary as you would think for most PUDs because there's so much recreation to the south, uh, to the east of this at Veterans Memorial Park. And um, the final waiver we have requested is a waiver to allow one main access point from Harbor Woods Boulevard in Fortenberry. Um, the access management code, uh, Brevard County Code 622957C1 requires three accesses for over 350 units. We do have an, a life safety expert that says that is not necessary with the two accesses that we do have, one on Fortenberry and one on Ocean Woods. And we're asking for a waiver to 622957C1 to allow two access entrances instead of three. Um, if necessary, we could do an access off of Plamosa, but there's some wetlands there that will have to be impacted, and we prefer not to do that. And the mm -hmm. residents really don't want more traffic on South Plamosa. It's somewhat of a substandard road and a local road that does not need more traffic. Uh, the staff has identified a concern as to Harborwood Boulevard. However, that was transferred, that actual road was transferred to the county by Pulte Group back in 2009, and um, the deed is OR Book 6033, page 2921, which I will submit that to Ms. Jones at the end of this. So Harbor Woods Boulevard is indeed owned by the county. It may not be county maintained, but it's owned by the county, and we should be entitled to access onto a county-owned road. The other issue identified is stormwater, and uh, Mr. Good is working with county staff to resolve whether or not um, Three of the four parcels was in that basin study for the Veterans Memorial Stormwater Basin, and they've been talking to staff, and hopefully we can get this third parcel pulled in as well. If not, the final development plan and site plan will have retention on site. We believe, the engineer believes, that stormwater will be able to use this existing basin, as was the plan for Veterans Memorial Park. Uh, staff also su suggest a SCAT bus stop, but there's one that already exists on Fortenberry, very near here and at the Mer Merritt Square Mall. So there's two SCAT stops in close proximity to this site, but the developer will look into maybe changing the bus stops or putting in something to make it uh, more friendly for bus usage. Myra board reviewed this on December 8th of 2022 and unanimously approved, uh, recommended approval of this PDP. It did not have the access management waiver or the storm or the, uh, or the, um, open space requirement, but they did have what was in front of you. They just, those waivers weren't on the PDP at the time. Uh, the Myra board's justification for the recommendation was the lack of new multifamily housing in Merritt Island to serve the needs of current residents and the growing employment base in the Space Coast. Uh, that Brevard County and Myra has a vision for a mixed use development around the mall to help meet the housing needs and pro promote economic development. And third, that the comprehensive plan states that the county should, quote, encourage high-density development in clustered patterns, end quote, which is what this is with the 
with the apartment complex. Additionally, we had a community meeting on January 4th of uh, 2023 at the Myra boardroom. Um, we sent out 150 notices. We had nine people show up. Um, the concerns that were raised at that community meeting were concerns with increased traffic on Harbor Woods Boulevard and traffic in the area, concern with future development plans for the mall and how that will affect roadway congestions, which there's nothing we can do about that. Um, concerns with safety of the intersections of Harbor Woods Boulevard and Fortenberry Road, which will be addressed with um, public works if there's any improvements that are needed offsite. The county will require that and the developer will in include that in their final development plan and site plan. The handling of stormwater, uh, again, that's going to be resolved through site plan. Um, who are the target renters? Uh, Mr. Abramson explained that these are luxury apartments and it will be for professionals. Again, the development of this is probably two years out, so we don't know the exact rate of the apartments, but this will be, I mean, I grew up here. This is the first new apartment complex since the early 80s that I can recall in Merritt Island. Uh, they were concerned about a type of construction, which is, is intended to be concrete block, but again, two years from now, we don't know what construction prices will be, but there's definitely going to be elevators in these apartments. Uh, the, um, those that attended were concerned about construction noise, again, that's regulated by performance standards of Brevard County. And they were concerned about the landscape and buffering, which we will uh, commit to whatever the code requires, and this will be keypad access into the community. Um, Mr. James Taylor, as I said, can discuss the traffic analysis. It was submitted. If you have questions about traffic, he is more than willing to do that. And we have Ross Abramson, the developer's representative, um, which can discuss the specifics of the PDP. Also, what's before you was the rendering that we showed to the, re to the people that came before uh, to the community meeting. And we're happy to put this up here for the. So that's the, the rendering of the buildings and the clubhouse. And that is the, uh, basically what was shown to the residents. Uh, and if, um, so if you're looking at this and you see the building on the top there, which is um, up adjacent to Fortenberry, it's building one, that's 145 feet from the property line to the west next to the credit unions. To the south there, or to the east, excuse me, building three, um, that's 147 feet from the property line to the east. Uh, to, I can't read this to the west, but it goes through the wetland area, which will be maintained. And then the uh, building five, which is adjacent to Harbor Woods Boulevard, that building is 95 feet from the property line to the south as well. So there are substantial buffers for these buildings. Um, Kim, hold on one second. The residents that you had show up, you said you had nine? Yes, sir. What was their reaction? As I said, they were concerned about traffic noise. Several of them just wanted to know what was going on. Um, there were a couple that were dead set against it. They don't want apartment complexes. They don't, they don't really want changes. I mean, that is a very nice piece of property that's there right now with wetlands and trees. Right, So. okay. Um, we had one opposition email from Ms. Waxman who did show up um, as well. And she lives in the subdivision to the west across South Plumosa. All right. So, um, Mr. Abramson. Uh, I just want to mention two things. Um, first is we're very excited to be a part of Brevard County already. Uh, we have a site in Palm Bay that we own. We're going through the entitlements on um, a second site in Palm Bay that we're adding to that. Uh, we're hoping to break ground this summer, a uh, $125 million mixed-use project. Uh, and we'd love to get your support to continue and expand in Brevard County with this project that we're really excited about. Um, I also want to speak to the quality that we develop. Um, we really pride ourselves on being the custom design apartment developer. We're not the cookie cutter guys. Um, so we hire top tier consultants, uh, architect, uh, landscape architect, interior design, civil engineers. Um, and so these are proposed as luxury rental apartments. We're putting a lot of thought into it and attention to detail. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, if I can just interject for a second. So I just want the board to understand 
Waiver number three has not been analyzed by staff of whether the impacts that or not, and that's the, the requirement for the three access points. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Pete. Uh, thank you. Uh, just going back to that question there, um, would that go to the site plan review for the three access points or two or three for the waiver? Well, the, the waiver process, it's kind of like in the, in the middle of things because this is a PDP that this is a site plan. What they show now gets transferred to the site plan process. So this is a public hearing. So potentially they could they could ask for it at the site plan process, but, could, but since this is a PDP, they're asking for, for it now. Unfortunately, staff hasn't had the opportunity to review that as far as impacts with the traffic and, and how that does not meet the code. Okay. Um, may I, sir? Yeah. But you right. know, we can make that a requirement of the BDP that we only want two. You, could, you, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need a, a BDP in this because PUD zoning allows for you to condition that. So what I would suggest that you do is condition it to require to or whatnot. I mean, that's certainly, you know, under your purview of to grant the require the waiver for having only two access points. I don't think we're going to deal with that yet, but we'll certainly be talking about it. Um, with that, I would request recommendation of approval of PD. PUD zoning, the PDP with the conditions listed on the staff report. The developer is um, fine with those conditions listed in the staff report and um, the PDP as presented with the waiver. Again, uh, Mr. Minibe, you know if Public Works doesn't like it, we're not going to be able to do it and we'll, we'll access through Plumosa. So, but we're asking for that. <coughs> um, we've run it through a life safety expert that doesn't think it's necessary. It's 20 units above the requirement. As I said, Mr. Taylor is here if you have any traffic questions or if anything comes up, if any public comments. So, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Hold on one second. John Pete okay. was. Oh, thank you. I just, these are my initial thoughts here. Um, they're putting a, the three acres of, um, of wetlands, um, four, four acres of common open space. This is a 15 acre property. So over 50, right about, let's call it over 40% of the property is going to be um, open space or or wetlands, so that kind of decreased the density for, for me, thinking of that. So I, I think they, they, this property could get away with the two, that, that waiver of the two interests and exit, right. exits. Um, those are my initial thoughts. I want to hear more from the board. Um, but so far, uh, talking about the third entrance and exit, I, preserve, I, I would prefer to preserve that wetland instead of putting an entrance and exit through it. Those are my initial thoughts, but uh, you know, Mr. Maybe I, I want to hear from you as well, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir, John. Um, it looks like people worked over Christmas to do this because what was presented at Myra prior to the Christmas break were three-story buildings and one five-story, I believe. So now I see that you're doing five stories. What is the building height? The, the building height is 60 to 62 feet, but there was at least one five-story. Yeah, there was one five-story okay. in the other one. Okay, I, I think we had two three-story buildings and we had four five-story buildings before? No. No? Okay. No. Well, I have your, uh, what you presented to Myra. That's it. And what was in our package was different from that, and now what you've given us today is different than that. But I have no problem with it, as long as it, 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 it complies. You are putting elevators in all your buildings? Yes. Yeah. That was one of the issues I had at the Myra meeting, mm -hmm. that uh, you weren't going to put any elevators in. Yep. Um, Ms. Rosanka mentioned that you're not sure if you're building this out of block or c concrete, or are you going to look at wood? Our intention right now is to build out of concrete, and that's what we're having general contractors pricing. That's how we're designing it right now. But in two years, if concrete doubles in price, then it's not feasible. Uh, that's the only reason why I said we intend to build in concrete. Okay. All right. Um, what about the waiver on the open space? How was that resolved? Has, have you guys seen the, the request for waiver? Because I don't think that they have the 5.5 acres. They don't, and that's the, that's the waiver request is to reduce that 
open space requirement. Our code requires for multifamily to have 25% open space, so that's 4.5, or I'm sorry, that's 5.5 acres. So with the waiver, you're reducing the open space by one acre. And that okay. came to us in the staff report. The staff report essentially said you need to ask for this waiver, so that's why we're not asking for it. Okay. And again, we believe that's appropriate because of the wetlands and because of the Veterans Memorial Park, which has so many amenities there for the residents. Uh, has anybody suggested um, widening the road between the Fortenberry and, um, I don't know, is that Plamosa? That's um, in, front of, in front of the Veterans Memorial. It's only two lanes, and then it goes to four lanes. Are they going to open that up? That's all Fortenberry. I don't, we don't know yet. Mr. Menabu is shaking his head no. That's a no? Okay. Uh, they do that's consider. Side Creek Parkway over there, so. Well, but the people that are exiting here may need to get out yeah. that way. The staff report actually refers to that as, a, as an urban collector, Fortenberry. Uh -huh. which I, I don't know what know that, that means. I don't either, but it sounded big. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I had one more question, which I can't remember. I'll just let it pass. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kim, let me take it out to the... Mr. Yes, sir, Mr. Robert. Can you turn your mic on? Uh, my apologies. Uh, yeah, I do know what an urban collector is. And because it is an urban collector, um, you know, has this gone through fire safety for no site plan review on that no yet. sir this okay. is just a preliminary development plan it's a concept plan in essence okay. it's not full for it's not full engineering and in fact as i've mentioned we've changed engineers right and it's still working with the stormwater and, uh, and okay. again access management you know they can require the county can require us to do off-site improvements if it's necessary for the project yeah it's oh uh, for me the the height of the building and the, and the limiting the number of access is mainly fire rescue and first responders um not necessarily access for individuals. Um, so it's always worst case scenario design. The stormwater, you're, you're trying to use the wetlands as no, a sir. collection? No, the, sir. The Veterans Memorial Park, is, as I understand that, it, that was designed to take stormwater from mm -hmm. an entire area. And Mr. Good could explain this okay. better than I could. But that was the idea was to take water all the way from 520 back to these properties and, and to have extra capacity. It may even be, I think it, it connects to the Merritt Square Mall stormwater. Okay. I know you're familiar with that area. But Mr. Good could answer that. But stormwater is obviously a site plan issue. Correct. We believe that there's extra capacity at the Veterans Memorial Park. If not, they're going to have to redesign stormwater. Right. And you'll have less units. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I remembered what I forgot. Yes, sir. Mr. John. Yes. Um, you're going to have 370 units that's a lot of people with children. Um, is there any way to put in some sort of um, playground area at the pool site to accommodate them? Because there's nothing for them to go to to play. Yeah, we haven't started really going into the details of that pool amenity area, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly we could put in a, a children's playground in there. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rod. Uh, the roadway uh, that's not county maintained or is county maintained. It's uh, owned by the county. Uh, s staff, do you, uh, can you verify that it's owned by the county? And I obtained that information from the Broad County Property Appraiser's Office, George Massolino. He actually gave me the deed, which I've just supplied to the county. Okay. If Have you seen the road? Is it... Uh, is it going to be, does it need maintenance to accommodate these people coming out of this development? Or, and if so, if it's not county maintained, who's going to pay for that? There, there, there was a traffic, or I should say uh, tra traffic impact analysis that was done. Staff is in the process of reviewing that. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the comments from that. So I can't speak about whether or not from a staff perspective that there's going to be any deficiencies or operational improvements. I would assure you that that review will be um, forthcoming and will be presented to the board at the time that this goes to the board. 
as far as the um, maintenance and, and um, um, of the Harbor Boulevard or the Har Harbor, Woods. Harbor Woods Boulevard, uh, it's my understanding that it is a, um, a county road that's maintained by others, so that would be a private road. They would still need to get approval from that maintenance entity to get access to that, as far as my understanding. But I'm not an engineer that uh, that um, that works through that. That will all be handled through Public Works and 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 figured out at a later stage. Okay, so it's not county maintained. It's maintained by somebody else, and you don't know who that somebody else is, do you? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to help you? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not staff. Okay. Harbor Woods has been there since probably the 80s. It, they maintained it, they've maintained it for years. And there's always been some question about ownership of that right of way, which is not uncommon, Ron, here. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you, to the best of my recollection, they're, they're trying to pick on the old brain here, but I, I'm almost sure, you know, 208 or 209 that the county it, it was turned over to the county for numerous reasons at that particular point in time so it's maintained by harbor woods it's been there for years you know the configuration of it i'm extremely adamant about if you got an existing access point utilize it don't go in there and create three access points on Fortenberry. Yeah. That I do, I'm not suggesting that no, no, it no, needs to be another one. I'm, I, my only concern is... Your concern is, is who maintains it. Who it's maintains it, yeah. and is that a problem for the applicant that she needs to look into yeah. uh, you know, to, to answer that question? Because I, I would assume the same question is going to come up for the county commission. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I did have another... Oh, and we do intend to find that out as soon as possible. <laughs> okay. I did have another question, uh, or a couple questions. One was, uh, since you're close to the Merritt Square Mall, and there is a traffic way between your development and Merritt Square, have you thought about any kind of access to Merritt Square for people who are walking? Uh, we, we have not, but that's certainly something we will look into. Okay. I don't know whether... I mean, it would be really nice if it were an overpass, a walk overpass, but that may be more than you're willing to do, but at least that needs to be addressed, I believe. Uh, and the last question was, uh, considering climate change and sea level rise and that Merritt Island is only, average elevation is only three feet, uh, these buildings, what have you done to take into account that kind of problem? Uh, the, approximately the northern half of the site is out of a flood zone, but we'll be bringing up the whole site and building our buildings above the flood elevation. Okay. Which is a minimum of one foot above the base flood elevation. Okay. I know that uh, the hospital that's going into Merritt Square, I mean uh, across from Merritt Square, they have made significant changes to their plan to accommodate that sea level rise, intense, anticipated sea level rise. Uh, so that when things do flood, and they will, uh, they can, they can, it won't be a problem. I was just wondering, on the first floor, are you going to be having, like, for example, nothing but office space? Uh, this is a fully residential, except for the clubhouse. Um, so it'll be residences on the ground level of the, the residential buildings. Okay. All right. Just curiosity. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be building above the FEMA flood elevations. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from board? I don't think I took this out to the audience, but is there anyone in the audience want to speak for or against this item? Sir, if you would, come on up and state your name and address for the record.
Hello, my name is Phil Cohen. I'm a property owner on the south side of this project. I'm not necessarily against it or you're, for it. I'm sorry, your address too, please. The address would be 426 and 420 South Plumosa Street. Okay. Um, I, uh, I, there's a couple of things that concern me. One was the, the water runoff of this many buildings in this tall building. Um, there's a lot of uh, low-lying areas around there. Um, also, the fact that you got you just mentioned originally there was going to be three-story buildings, and now it's turned to five. Um, these people are going to be looking down on the neighboring properties. Um, also, the fact that you need a waiver because you really, to meet code, need another 1.1 acres of open space as well, the possibility of a third access point, which I would assume would be along Plumosa Street. I think there are options that all these things could be met. And if the project right. is done correctly, um, I have no problems with it going in. Um, the traffic as well along Fortenberry is getting pretty bad. There's one turning lane going into the mall. As somebody mentioned, there's only two lanes from the veterans all the way to Plumosa with a couple of uh, turning lanes, but only in one direction and not the other. Um, if there's only two accesses along Plumosa, I'm sorry, along Fortenberry, it, traffic is gonna be crazy unless that is widened to two lanes or a full turning lane along that whole corridor. So um, just concerns, I'd like to voice my opinion. Uh, I go. think they have options here. Oh yeah, so, and they've only just begun. Correct, so before <laughs> we just grant waivers at the very first meeting, well, these are my concerns. Still a lot more hoops to jump through. Yeah, I All thank right. you for the time. Thank you, sir. Anybody else want to speak for or against this item? All right, seeing that, Miss Kim, if you could come back up to the podium. I bring it back to the board. Any questions for her? Are the waivers included today because of the increase in height? Uh, or at least two of that, them? That waiver was always there, that waiver to the height. Um, the two new waivers are the open space waiver because there was a miscalculation when you go to so many units you have to have more open space mm -hmm. and then the um, the access came up during staff report as well we did not know about that that we needed three access points so this is a PDP which is the preliminary development plan It's a concept plan with a little more to show how this could look it hasn't been fully engineered hasn't been reviewed by every department of right. the city it I mean, excuse me the county and so this is the, the the waivers are anticipated that's one of the main purposes of a pud is to allow waivers so you can preserve wetlands so you can rearrange your buildings so you can do things you couldn't do in normal circumstances under an ru 215 or ru 230 because initially we thought about going to ru 230 uh, but this was able to cluster and also too we we have increased the setbacks the setback to mr cohen's property is 147 feet and it's on the edge of the building. It's not where the windows are going to be facing his property. So Mr. Cohen's property is uh, right here. And that's a distance of 147. And again, it's the edge of the building. Um, and the, the only other buildings that are, all the other buildings facing south, which are where the condominiums are, are also all the small edges of the building. So this has been a work in progress, um, and these waivers were, two of them were brought up during staff comments. That's why they're now included. Staff basically said, you need to ask for these. That's how I read it in the staff report. So, but again, we still have to go through final development plan and site plan, so, and oh, yeah. county commission. Yes. Thank you, Ken. Ken. With that, I would request approval. You ready? Yes, sir. Um, is your is your civil people looking at the primary as the drainage for the drainage to the pond to the east? Is that where your emphasis is, or are you just flipping a coin? <laughs> no, we, we we're engineers. We don't okay, flip coins. <laughs> um, 
the 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 intent is to utilize the desire is to utilize the existing ponds those those ponds around Veterans Park that's what they were built for um, in doing the research the drainage basin line for those ponds runs right through the middle of this project um, in talking with staff um, there has been some internal discussions and thoughts that they should open that up a little bit to allow some of these surrounding parcels to also utilize those existing ponds because there are some parcels within that basin that will never be redeveloped and never utilize the capacity that was planned for them so that they could fully utilize the capacity that was that was built into those ponds you know it's it, it was such a great concept and i just hate to see it get away you know all the drainage up at 520 i don't need to go through the detail but that's what it was designed to do down there it and it's yeah i just hate you know to, to let that get away it's it's treatable uh, you know i don't need to go into the details but that that was one of the things i was concerned with are you also handling the traffic side as no, far sir. as two driveways you do you all have heartburn and indigestion with that i i would defer to the to the now traffic been, engineer yeah, I knew on you that one toss that <laughs> I, you know, I feel real strong about it. I mean, you got an existing driveway, Ron, that's been there for years and it works. People, they've got to be happy or they'd be complaining. And uh, that, you know, you divert there and then you're going to be, this other driveway is going to be close to what, uh, you know, the Space Coast Credit Union. So, I don't know, just technically it makes sense, but the traffic people can handle that so but if the decisions made to move forward on this I'd like to put that in a binding development plan you want to put that in a motion mr. Henry yes sir let you guys clean it up but you know the content <laughs> You, you want one access on Fortenberry and one on Harbor Woods? Is that what yes, you're sir. trying to? Yes, sir, I think so. I think the emphasis should be placed on that, and then the technical people inside can deal with it, but it just, it's, it's just got just good common sense. I think we still do a little bit of that, not much. Let's skip. Sorry. Well, that's the intent. That's actually what we put, set forward in the BDP, and it would be a note on the PDP that that's what's intended. Actually, I think it would be in your in your your uh, yeah, comments. Yeah, but now you can blame it on us, Kim. Okay, so it would be a condition of approval uh, along with the other conditions set forward with the staff. I believe that's how that would work because that would then transfer with the PDP, and ultimately could be in the general statement on the FDP if necessary. But I think staff understands. I understand that. So, so, <laughs> so we would potentially have a condition number eight to require a one axis on Fortenberry and one axis on Harbor Woods Boulevard. Do you understand, Mr. Menabu's motion? Okay, I need a second. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion by Henry. And we need removal of the BDPs. Please. That's included. Yes, we're all good to go, right? Let me let me just so for Jennifer's edification. So your motion is approval with the eight conditions: the one added, the one axis on Fortenberry, one axis on Harbor Woods Boulevard, and the removal of the two existing BDPs. Yes. Second. Good. Good job. <laughs> okay. A motion by Henry. A second by Pete. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That passed unanimously. Thank you. I came prepared. Okay, meeting adjourned. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 yeah, buddy. <laughs> well, we're gonna <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna try to minimize this if we can. But now that's this is gonna be everyone's personal yes or no but I understand that we have an attorney that's representing and I think Kim you're involved here correct now 
Can we have a show of hands of those people that are for this item? It's the Canes furniture. The apartment's behind there. Mr. Chair, can we can we re read both items in so we can start the discussion and okay. then we can go? Okay. Item H8 is Canes Furniture LLC requests a small scale comprehensive plan amendment number 22S.16 to change the future land use designation from CC and Res 4 to Res 15. The application number is 22SS00012 for tax account numbers 2800116 and 2800342 in District 5. There's a companion rezoning application. Item H9, Canes Furniture LLC requests a change of zoning classification from RU17 and BU1 with an existing BDP to RU215 and removal of existing BDP. That application number is 22Z00052 for tax account number 2800116 and 2800342, also in District 5. Um, I'd like to provide a clarification in the um, agenda report for uh, the small scale. Um, it was noted that there was one vacant property zoned RU215 multifamily zoning classification. Um, that should, should read RU26. It is multifamily um, and it is vacant, but it is not RU215, it is RU26. Okay. So Mr. Chair, Jane read both of these items into the record. You can have discussions as far as land use and zoning at the same time. However, you will need to make separate motions for each. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So anyhow, we have a handful of people that are for this item. now. Can I see a show of hands of those that are opposing? All right, now do we have somebody representing the people that are opposing? Is there an attorney? Okay, the reason I'm asking is if I grant, we have maybe 120, 30 people in here at three minutes, 360, at six hours. So we're going to get home at 10 o'clock. Uh, well, I mean, I know it's fine. We're not getting paid for this. We're, ju we're just an advisory board. And, and this guy over here has got all the advice on the end. So, but now, would it be opposed or would y'all be opposed to have like one person representing 10 people? Yes. So everyone wants to speak their mind even though they're opposed. Everyone's raised their hands. Correct. Well, I can give you three minutes each person. I mean, it, and if everyone's just gonna say, we're against it, we're against it, we're against it. I mean, you know, we're gonna be here all night. So, well, so I mean, here again, if we could admit, sir, uh, the attorney in the rear, how many people approximately are you representing? Six. Okay. So now, are the other six that you're representing still wanting to speak, even though you're representing them? <laughs> okay, what we're gonna, I'm gonna do then, is I'm gonna call people up. We're gonna have the applicant produce their item. And if you're just gonna say something that someone else has already said, please work with us. I mean, because I know it's a touchy item, it's right next to your house, and you're worried about this, you're worried about that, but here again, we are only zoning. We're not about stormwater runoff. We're not about chickens and roosters. You know, we're about zoning. So it's whether or not they can zone this to do this. And so, and if everyone, please be respectful to each other and cell phones off, and we'll, I'm gonna try to just go through this. Can I? You already said no. Three minutes. See, I wanted to go to two, and he's wanting to go to three. So I'm going to give each person when we start talking three minutes. And when the bell rings, please stop. All right. 
All right, is the applicant here? Sir. I get more than three. Yes, you do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, uh, uh, good afternoon, Chairman Wadsworth, members of the Planning and Zoning Board, Kim Rozanka with Lacey Lines Rozanka here on behalf of Terwilliger Brothers Residential LLC and Kane's Furniture. With me today is Bruce Terwilliger and Jared Smith with Terwilliger Brothers Residential, Jim McKnight, an expert planner, Bruce Moya, MBV Engineering, he's the engineer of record, and James Taylor with Kimley Horn, who's the traffic engineer. Um, Terwilliger Brothers Residential LLC is a Florida-based apartment development company with, uh, with over 30 years experience in apartment development, and they have developed um, in the United States for decades. There are two applications before you. The first is a small-scale amendment on 12.59 acres, changing, requesting to change community commercial of 4.35 acres and residential four, 8.23 acres, all to res 15. The zoning application has changed BU1 of 4.35 acres and RU17 of 8.23 acres to RU215. I know you're very familiar with what can be purchased, or purchased, what can be built in BU1 and RU17, but just generally, BU1 allows general retail commercial uses, including drug stores, gas stations, bowling alleys, foster homes, pawn shops, outdoor restaurant seating, tourist efficiencies, and bars. RU17 allows 5,000 square foot lots for single family homes, as well as bed and breakfast and resort dwellings. There's a 35, height, 35 feet height limitation in RU17 and five foot setbacks from side lot lines. This is an infill development, is property that's been vacant for a very long time. It's next to Kane's uh, Furniture Store on West New Haven, also known as 192. This is intended to create additional housing as needed in Brevard County and to provide a variety of housing choices as specified in the Brevard County Comprehensive Housing Element. The request is for 186 apartments, six three-story buildings with elevators, and a clubhouse with recreation and a dog park its keypad access is fully gated, fenced, and landscaped. Sewer will be brought to the site instead of building single family homes on septic, which could be done at a quarter acre lots. Stormwater treatment will be provided to the site that currently has absolutely no drainage controls. All county code requirements as to roadway improvements and parking will be met at the site plan stage. Uh, there is a uh, market study that's been presented that I will review briefly that shows that the need for this uh, for engineers and healthcare workers and other professionals is an average income of 70,000 to 80,000 a year. The location of the site, how do I advance this? The location of the site as referenced, uh, this is also in your packet, this is actually from the packet. Uh, it is the site to the, to the east and south of Kane's Furniture there's commercial development along West New Haven. And as you can see on the far right, that's Lowe's, Lowe's uh, home furnishings, which is within 1,070 feet of this site. And as far, and the depth is as far as this site is going as well, which is a very high intense commercial use. Residential is located west, south, and east of the proposed complex. Um, as you'll see, well, as you can't see, if you look to the south, you see homes, but some are very far away. And if you look to the east, there's a high density of trees and the houses are far back away from the site. There was a community meeting on December 14th, 2022 at the Hampton Inn off of 192 in Melbourne. Approximately 45 people attended. 49 notices were mailed on November 30th of 2022. So the word did get out um, and people did attend. They were concerned with the increased traffic on Seminole Boulevard, which is the access road to the west of uh, Kane's Furniture. They were concerned with the height and the ability of tenants to look into the adjacent homes. Again, this is going to be 35 feet, the same that RU17 could be, except RU17 could be much closer to the property lines. They are concerned with increased crime, noise, reduction of wildlife, flooding and stormwater, concerned with changes to the vacant property, most simply did not want multifamily at this location. It was a very heated meeting. 
as you, I'm sure, can see from the hundreds of pages of comments. Uh, again, the developer and the property management company will comply with all performance standards of the county code regarding noise and any other crime, any performance standard that's required um, and that are site plan issues. Based upon the concerns raised, the concept plan was revised to increase the setbacks, buffering, and location of the buildings and location of the entrances off of Seminole Boulevard. Mr. Moya will explain those as he is the one that's designed that. And he has handouts for you and I have a copy for the audience to see on the aerial overhead. Kim, I'm gonna ask you to reiterate existing zoning, what's allowed. Uh, Mr. McKnight's gonna go through that in detail. Okay. But yes, it's BU1 so and it's- we're proposing. Right, BU1, a little over four proposing. acres can have very intense uses. So Mr. Moya will discuss. Also, um, the list of those that were sent notices has been submitted um, to Ms. Jones for the record of the 49 that were mailed notices based upon a 500 foot radius. We have a lot of public comment. We do. Good evening. Thank you, uh, board. My name is Bruce Moya with MBB Engineering. I am the engineer of record of the project, and I was in attendance at the public hearing that we held. And um, based on the conversations that were had at that meeting, we did make some modifications to the plan that I've just passed out. Um, I think if you saw the old plan that might have been in your package, uh, there was some concern about the location of the driveway on Seminole. We moved that about 200 feet to the north to get it as far as close to 192 as possible. Uh, we moved the clubhouse down and the uh, amenities down and away from the residents as much as possible. And we proposed to screen those so that there won't be any light shining into the neighborhood. Uh, and then we moved the, the buildings, two of the buildings on the east side, another 10 feet farther away from the residential properties. So um, that was, well, well, we could come out of, of some of the comments at the meeting, and uh, so we made our best, uh, did our best to make some revisions to make it as least impactful as possible. Thank you. And again, this is a concept plan, as your staff report says, it's not required, but we're willing to put this into a binding development plan to assure you that the impacts will be as limited as possible. Um, next. We have Jim McKnight, who is an expert planner, who will dis discuss the proposed changes. I didn't know I was an expert on anything. <laughs> um, I'm Jim McKnight. I'm the land use consultant for this project. Um, going to try to not repeat any of what Ms. Rosanka has gone over. The parcel in question is currently given a land use designation of community commercial and we're prime. Oh, yeah, go back to land use plan if you would. Yeah. Future land use, that's it. That's what I need. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Of community commercial, uh, which provides a wide range of commercial uses. I am not going to list all of them. I think I counted like 75 different uses in uh, BU1, which is currently the zoning on the property. I'm talking about the future land use plan. Um, things such as convenience stores, laundromats, grocery stores, hardware stores, restaurants, pawn shops, and a number of other things. Uh, of the total property under consideration, the commercial is about one third, or the 4.35 acres that was referred to by Ms. Rosanka. Under current zoning height, it can range from 35 feet to 60 feet, and it is dependent upon what the abutting uses are. Uh, 35 foot single family, 45 feet for multifamily, and 60 feet uh, when it abuts either medium density residential or commercial, and some of this commercial property does abut other commercial property. The floor area ratio would provide a one under the code of the county, uh, technically, that it could allow you up to 190,000 square feet. Obviously, you have to consider all of the things such as landscaping and parking, but you can go multi-story too. And if you do go multi-story, the height does not count of the parking area. 
It begins at basically the floor level of the first story. Uh, again, other concise considerations are always important. The balance of the property, which would be the other two thirds or over eight acres, is residential four at the current time, uh, which is primarily residential homes. Uh, the property in this area is bordered by the road right of way of Seminole Boulevard and unimproved Miami Avenue. The property to the east is residential on larger lots. When commercial and single family abut, the introduction of low to medium density multifamily is generally an acceptable land use that transitions from the higher intensity um, to, the, to the single family. This is, in, and when I say the higher intensity, I'm referring to the commercial that is up front on this property. This is considered a step down in land use and can include development approaches such as tree buffering, stormwater separation, and permanent fixtures such as walls and fences. In this urbanized area of Highway 192, Residential 15 has already been introduced to a similar depth on the north side of 192. You can see it on the map. Um, possibly not quite as deep as we have on this, but it's a similar situation where it is behind the commercial. It is also adjacent to single family uh, on two sides. And while currently these parcels are not developed, uh, these larger lot, uh, parcels will more than likely one day de be developed as medium density uh, multifamily. Finally, it should be noted that the area is certainly along an urban and significant growth corridor. Land use is usually only changed for two reasons. One is either a mistake in the original designation, I don't think I can necessarily say that's true here, or a change in the character of the area. Certainly this area has grown uh, significantly. Uh, I've been here my entire life and I've seen this area grow. Um, and with that, I will either defer to questions or I'm done. Knight, could you give a little bit about your background and training? And oh, yes. Mr. Chairman, I've got one question. Um, Jim, in light of what Kim has conveyed here, that you can do X amount of units with, without a modification, have you accumulated all those totals and said, instead of whatever you're asking for now? You, you, in other words, how many units could be built? Is yes, that the question? Right now. I think staff had put in there 58. I think it ranges from 58 to 74, depending on how it would be developed. Okay. Because in the commercial code of BE1, you can actually build single family. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it's somewhere between 58 and 74. I'll go with staff and say it's 58. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some quick calculations. But, you know, it all comes down to how you construct it roads, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, you know that better than I do. Yeah. So uh, I think it's, again, important. If you want to know my background, I have a master's degree in planning. I've spent 42 years in local government in Brevard County. I worked for the county in planning for about four years. And I've been uh, a development director in the city of Cocoa. I've been a city manager in Rockledge and Cocoa Beach. And I'm retired uh, about a year ago and I'm doing this now. So <laughs> again, um, that is my background. Any questions? That was, that was your one hand. Okay. No, we're good. All right, thank you. I have some questions. For Can, him? Well, for him and, and for Ken. You wanna do a okay. after public comment or before? Before. Okay. Um, next, James Taylor with Kimley Horn, the traffic engineer who pr prepared the traffic impact analysis and also did a spreadsheet of the, what <clears throat> traffic could be with the current zoning and future land use that I will hand out to you. Good afternoon, James Taylor, Kimley Horn and Associates, 189 South Orange Avenue, Orlando, Florida. I am a uh, transportation engineer by trade. I've had my PE license since 2004, uh, did studies before that for other PEs, uh, professional engineers, licensed by the state of Florida. Uh, my clients 
range from private sector clients, developers, uh, DOTs, as well as cities. So I sit on many sides of the table, depending on who my client is. Um, so it looks like Kim shifted to the screen. Uh, thank you. So a traffic study was performed in accordance with the county's requirements, um, and they are many. And what we do with staff is we sit down early, we develop a list of assumptions that we're going to use in the study before we put pencil to paper and actually do the analysis. Um, we've worked with staff on that methodology for doing the traffic study, uh, got it approved, and then proceeded with the analysis. The study area for this particular development based on the amount of trips is about a uh, half a mile, so a radius around the property. All of the major roadway segments and intersections within that area were analyzed. Um, we did do a AM peak hour analysis as well as a PM peak hour analysis given that with a residential um, uh, land use, the trips are moving one way one time of the day and the other way the other time of the day. So we wanted to make sure that we capture both of those analysis. We did um, the reporting in accordance with DOT guidance because there is state roadways involved. Uh, the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization requirements list capacities on the roadway segments. And then of course the county requirements list the level of service requirements that need to be maintained on county roads. This will be a traffic study that after going through the county's review, we'll have to go through a DOT review for uh, access permitting. The conclusions of the, re of the report, um, just a quick overall summary, is that the project is anticipated to generate about 1,200 daily trips. Um, that's based on the 186 units that are being proposed. Uh, what that looks like in the PM peak hour is about 101 trips. So that's that's the ins plus the outs. So you can do over over the course of an hour, that looks like a trip in and a trip out uh, of the site. And then those will be divided amongst the, the different driveways. Now, as, as Kim alluded to, this is a, a factor that's significantly less than can be developed on the site today um, with the commercial uses. So when, when you calculate what the existing code allows for the the different acres and the different uses on this site, it's roughly about 175,000 square feet of commercial, plus um, some measure of single family units. You've heard 58 being floated around. Um, I actually took that number a little bit less to only be about 32 once you put in the infrastructure that's involved on the site and that will take up some space for where the units would be. So when you do that math, again, that's about a trip generation for what could be developed of about 6,800 trips a day, where we anticipate the site is about 1,200 trips. And in the PM peak hour, it could be 629 trips based on the maximum potential capacity, where the site is anticipated to be about 101 PM peak hour trips. We did take those trips and put them onto the roadway network. We ran a model that DOT requires us to run to match up the trips from this site with jobs in over the course of a day. Um, we did use the capacities that are adopted by the transportation planning organization that the county regularly uses in the report and concluded that there are no roadway segments identified within that half mile study area that are deficient at the build out or in the existing. So for the intersections, we also did analysis in the AM and the PM peak and found that there were no new deficiencies. That's not to say that there aren't some approaches out there today that have high delays, uh, but no new turn lanes or turn lane extensions are needed to accommodate those queue links that are anticipated in the build out above and beyond. Please. Okay. Thank you. And then finally, when we evaluate for driveway turn lanes per DOT's guidelines and also the county's requirements, no turn lanes were identified as needed for these driveways in the future. Um, I wanted to show you an exhibit from the traffic study to kind of give you a sense of where, where we anticipate the traffic to move, where your staff has agreed and also uh, validated by DOT's modeling. Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of concerns today about Seminole Boulevard and the amount of traffic that will be moving south of the site. Um, that's anticipated to be somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the traffic. So we're talking about, remember, I'm going back to that 100 trips in the PM peak hour. 
we're talking about 20 trips over the course of an hour and then divide those by each direction. So not a lot of traffic. We do have 24 hour counts on Seminole Boulevard as well as on Henry Avenue. Um, there's only about 2,000 vehicles on each of those uh, roads today on roads that have the capacity to take well over 10,000. Um, the remainder of the traffic will be anticipated to head towards 192 by two ways. The right in, right out, if you can see the, the brown number four intersection is the driveway um, where we anticipate about half of the remaining traffic that isn't going south to go north. And then they'll also head to Seminole Boulevard, um, roughly the same amount anticipated and do the same thing. We've done queuing uh, analysis at all of these intersections to determine that the turn lanes that are out there today in 192 are sufficient to accommodate this future traffic. Um, there were some concerns in the public comments about the queuing at number one, uh, and that is one of those approaches if you're heading northbound on Seminole Boulevard that there is a high delay today. In fact, it's categorized as a level service F, which is about as bad as you can get in terms of those level service designations. However, the queue only builds back about six vehicles at the build-out analysis, which doesn't impact any of those driveways. Um, that would be you know, something that overall the intersection is within the adopted level service um, allowance. Uh, but as you see on a lot of DOT roadways, priority is to those major street volumes. So there, there's going to be many um, roadways along 192 that you'll have the same condition where there is a high delay at the minor approach. And with that, I'll, I'll remain um, here for questions and answers now or later. Well, on your sheet, you have existing proposed, correct? Yeah, can we? Do you know how to flip back to that? Do you Thank have you. one? Yes, there it is. So I'm not a traffic engineer, yes, sir. but the existing zoning for this property is saying that it could be up to 620. In the PM peak hour, yes, sir. Now, what the applicant is proposing is going to be 500 an hour. Uh, 100 per hour. So 500 is the difference. So it is a significant down zone in terms of trip generation potential of the site. Yes, sir. That's not daily. That's PM peak. Right. Okay. Yeah, because it's 6,800 well, daily. The existing zoning's allowing 600. Okay. The proposed would take it to 100. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. You understand that correctly. So, do we have any other questions from before we get into public comment? I've got I would one. like for the board to have any questions we got from Ken. I got one for James. Mr. Bruce, James, whoever. Yes, sir, Mr. James, Henry. In your calculation, was all the roads that you took into account, or are they all of them still maintained or owned by the county? So 192 is a DOT roadway, but yeah, otherwise, um, yes. yes. But all the others are still county maintained or owned or something? Correct. In your calculation? Yes, sir. Okay. We have any other questions for the traffic? Uh, Mr. Ron. Yes. Uh, uh, Bruce said that he made a revision to the outlet uh, on Seminole Boulevard. Did that have any effect on your calculations? So at, at number five, that's still a full access. So no, sir. Okay. No change. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a few, but not for him. I, I don't understand traffic that much. <laughs> Other than when you say peak hours, 100 and something, I mean, yes, sir. if I had 186 units and everybody's going to work, how do you get 100 out of that? So the, these trip rates come from the Please, institute. audience, we got to work together here. So these trip rates are not something that I've come up with. They, they come from the Institute of Transportation Engineers documentation where they, they countrywide go out, they take counts at individual driveways, 
they divide it by the number of units at many, many of these facilities to determine what the trip rate is at one of, you know, something like a multifamily apartment developed. Mm -hmm. So these are then used by counties, cities, DOTs. It's kind of like the Bible of where to go for trip rates. Um, so for a multifamily, when we talk about 100 trips, that's occurring within one of the largest hours of the day between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. So they'll go out, they'll take counts from 4 to 6. They'll find, well, from 4.30 to 5.30, that's when the maximum happened at this site. What was that count? What was the unit count? Do the math. That's what the trip rate is per unit. And then that's averaged out throughout all of the studies that they've done countrywide. What, ab what about the morning? Same. So 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., the highest hour in, in that range. So when and everybody leaves, you're, you're only going to get 100? Doesn't, doesn't make sense. Let me get that for you. Let me come back with you with the AM number, okay. um, but it's going to be more or less the same, but the opposite direction. So more outs than ins, where PM is more ins than outs. Okay. Are, and I noticed in that chart that you had there, you had um, area four, which is the outlet to 192. The PowerPoint. Yes. That one, number four. Is that the primary entrance and exit to this site? So that's a right in, right out. Um, I wouldn't, I guess, yes, it's where most of the traffic is anticipated to occur in the outbound direction. If you're headed to the east, you would expect that folks would gravitate to that driveway. But then again, if you're headed to the west, you're probably going to head to Seminole Boulevard, um, go up and then make a left at 192. Um, if you're going to the south and or to the east, you may take the back door down to Hendry Avenue and over to Minton. Okay. Um, your site plan shows a basement under the access way there. And Bruce, you know that what that is? Where, where, are, you, where are you seeing basement? I'm seeing it printed um, just to the east of the uh, Kane store. Proposed access base, e oh, that's easement. I'm sorry, there was a basement. I saw the other one. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the no. trouble was this one was really hard to read. Yeah. Okay, sorry, it's no, just an no easement. Yeah. Okay, no are, you, are you, sorry. Are you considering the parking that's along there to be part of this site or is it still remain with Kane's? No, the parking that's there that's existing for Canes will be Canes, will and be Canes. we'll provide all the parking that we need on site. Okay, and is that a fact that you have sufficient parking? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. I believe it's at easement. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk to Kim now. Okay. okay. I, I have just a few more slides to show you. Sure. And this is because um, the residents were concerned that there was no need for apartments. Could you get a little closer, Kim? The residents were concerned there was no need for apartments. And before this deal ever came to be, there was a market study done um, by Terwilliger Brothers. Uh, it was done by RCLCO Real Estate Consulting. They're a national consulting company with over 50 years of experience. And they studied the Palm Bay, Melbourne, Titusville metropolitan statistical area and everything that's in the pipeline near here for apartments. And they did this whole analysis of the economic sector, who would be coming here, what the com competitions were and things like that. This is all in your packet. And uh, basically, um, they stated that the aerospace technology, engineering, manufacturing, construction industry, and healthcare industry needs housing. Um, it talks about where they would be coming from, and it's all over the county. These are the subject sites. Uh, the average, average rates would be 1.93 per square foot for 1,950 overall. That's currently, again, with construction costs, they could be higher. But they will have um, the, their position to bring in, in the renters that are needed to make this successful. The finishes, amenities, and parking um, again, they're going to be high-quality finishes with a strong amenity package, 
as we discussed with the pool, clubhouse, fitness center, media game room, outdoor seating, grilling area, um, a dog park, and again, fully gated and um, key entry. And um, basically the renter segmentation, segmentation um, it states that there's 886 units of annual demand for new multifamily. And this sets, you know, who is going to be there, family, single, couples, empty nesters, post-grad, young professionals. And so this was the market study um, that caused the uh, Trowiller brothers to come to this area and to negotiate with Kane's Furniture for a piece of property that's been vacant a very long time. Um, uh, with that, um, in summary, uh, this apartments are less intense use that could be that could be there, as you've heard from the engineer and the traffic engineer. 175,000 square foot of commercial could be in that four plus acres along 192, and also too, you could have 60 feet with a floor of parking underneath. A very high intense use, and uh, with no analysis of where they would go, but certainly they would be going down Seminole. Um, it's not the intent to harm the neighbors. It's the intent to build an apartment complex to serve the community and the needs of the community. Uh, again, also too, with the multifamily, you're going to be having sewer come in to the site. Otherwise, you could have single family on septic, which we know is, is, is not in the overlay district, but it's very close just to the north. And so we you do not want more septic tanks in this area either. Uh, this uh, development will do whatever the county requires, including sidewalks along Seminole Boulevard, improvements along Seminole Boulevard. Um, Mr. Moya had stated in the past this was a, a, a narrow road and there could be improvements that were needed um, to enhance Seminole and also to enhance this development. Uh, it will improve the stormwater runoff, which is currently uncontrolled, will provide impact fees for roads and schools, and increase property tax revenue to the county. Would request recommendation, recommendation of approval of the small scale Amendment to Res 15, rezoning RU 215, and removal of the 1999 BDP. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Now I can answer oh, questions. I want to One finish second. my questions. Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead. Um, the removal of the BDP, my favorite subject today. There's a stipulation in the existing BDP that it says developer owner will construct no buildings or parking on the southwest portion of the property. And that's where they have a parking lot and the pool house. Actually, if you read the BDP, it's four acres. It's unclear to me where those four acres, because there's no lot in block referenced. Currently, so, you're right, because it goes back to the, what, the old lot and block. It goes back to 1999. Yeah. And I, I, again, right. things were different in 1999. I don't know what was developed. I, I'm going to research it, to be honest. Please. Yes, because it's a four acre BDP with no lot and block reference. So it's very confusing as to where that is. Yeah. But we will I mean, I just looked it. at it from southwest of the, of the lot and uh, you've got something going in there. Um, I have one other question that you raised, but the traffic guy can tell me. What is the impact of a card key system going to be on the traffic flow? for people getting, coming back into the site. Will traffic start backing up on either 192 or on Seminole Boulevard? Yeah, that's a great question, and that will be something that we will have to address with the county to show the queuing, but um, do you have this on the, so, which one are you looking for? Um, this, I guess it has to be it's, over there. Yeah, it's not. Okay. It's, yeah, the, the site plan, and I can, I can put it back up on the screen, there is quite a bit of distance between Simona Boulevard and where the gate is proposed. Um, oh, there's actually two gates. So Bruce may have that distance memorized, but I do not. Um, <laughs> It looks to me like that can accommodate at least four vehicles before you start encroaching into uh, a disruption at Seminole Boulevard. Um, but we'll definitely look at that and address that concern with the county. Okay, thank you. That's all I got. Mr. Robert. Um, yeah, Bruce, if you don't mind. I'm looking also at the traffic uh, elements and it's the left-hand turn out to go to 95. So would there be short circuiting through after you get out of the gate because you have a right turn in, right turn out on um, 192, 
But if you're going to be going left to 95, would you, they be short-circuiting through the parking lot to get out? And I'm looking at the north end of the property. Well, I think they're going to figure out which way they're going to go before they get there. So the, 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 intersect, the intersection at Seminole 192 is a full, it's full median access. There's That's no, correct. It's not restricted. Yeah. Um, only where we come out to 192. <coughs> and, you know, DOT may say we need to modify that. We don't know right. that yet. Um, but, you know, obviously now to come out that you'd have to go. East. You'd have to go way down. And, on and DOT has no yeah. issue with U-turns. They actually prefer them. They think they're mm -hmm. safe. So if, if, if Seminole was to the point where you couldn't go left out of there, people could come out of 182, take a U-turn, and go west. Okay. Uh, and that was <clears throat> my number one issue on the traffic issue, is the left-hand turn because according to your economic studies, you're going to be looking at, you know, the Cape, NASA, and that area is for the high-end, um, you know, employment yeah. side for where you're justifying this here. The yeah, best way to do actually, that would be 95. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just looking at this earlier. There's about nine roads that come out on 192 yeah. from, um, from Estaminol out towards 95. Right. And six of them cannot go west. You have to go east, make a U-turn to go west. Correct. Yeah, that's where I was looking at. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from board for the applicant or the engineer or the traffic study? Because I'd like to get those questions out of the way before we get into public. Uh, okay. Uh, hey, Kim. Ms. Rosanka. Ms. Kim. Who is the, who's the owner of this? I mean, Kane's is this going to change? It is Kane's Furniture. It's Kane Furniture's it, own it, and it, um, Terwilliger Brothers would be purchasing it. They're the contract purchaser. Okay, they're a contract. So it has, it has nothing to do with Kane's developing this. Correct. Okay, thank you. Kim, I guess to reiterate, if the board doesn't have anything for her, say like the traffic study, Kim, from existing, we're going from approximately 600 to 100. Can you, what you're proposing as far as existing zoning to proposed uh, the just reiterate it because here again audience we are zoning that's all we are okay. we're not about all this other stuff right and this again this is a concept plan to show what's intended correct if there's conditions with setbacks and things like that uh, whatever entrances gated whatever we can put that into a binding development plan but this is the concept plan that's been designed so you're currently zone res 4 as we speak I want to go to Res 15, correct? Okay. Um, where it says CC, it's Community Commercial, and it's right. BU1, right. 4.35 acres. And then to the south of that is Residential 4. Correct. And uh, the request um, is Residential 4 and RU17, which is actually 5,000 square foot lots. And so that's going, uh, the request is to go to RU215 over the entire 12.59 acres. Any other questions from board? No. All right, Kim, if you could grab your stuff. I'm going to leave this here because the residents have not seen it, and they may want to see it as they come up and they comment on it. All right, well, what we could do is we could start at one row, and we can just work our way back. You know, so are you wanting to speak against this, sir? Yes, sir, are you? Okay, we're gonna start with this gentleman here. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you could raise your hand, and we're gonna to work to the right, jump back to you, ma'am. We're gonna come back, and we'll do this side, and then we'll start over here. Sir, I'm gonna give you a three minute time, and, and guys and ladies, when you hear the bell go off, please stop talking. We're talking six hours of public comment here. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Wilbur Colton, 2199 Ohio Street, June Park. Um, you know, as for mentioned, everybody knows 192 is already crazy. I mean, I've seen it backed up all the way to sometimes past Batteries Plus, and it can literally take 15 minutes to go from there 
to get to Mitten Road, just just to get there. Um, that, that, that's you know one of the, one concern. My other biggest concern, you know, our community is a very quiet community. It's it's well bred. I mean, chickens, goats, llamas, you know, it's it, that's what it is. You see people walking Miami all the time. There are children walking from their houses to the park. You put this many more people in the park, somebody's going to get hurt. It's probably going to be a child. You know, you guys, I realize you're, you're zoning, that's your job, but your job also is to look out for these people. These people are the most important people in your lives. Uh, that, that's all I got to say, but thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Ma'am, if you would like, sir, would you like to speak? Sir? And when you do start, if you would give your name and address, everybody, for the record. Okay. Thank you for hearing us. My name is Larry Vincent. I live at 2223 Merlin Drive. Yes, sir. And I know that we're a little bit far from this complex, but this will, in fact, our road going up and down Milwaukee. And we use Henry a lot of times because this is this gentleman was talking about. 192 is a nightmare in the morning at 8 o'clock. And so is Wickham at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, people trying to go south. You can't get in and out of 192. And these people are going to be coming over from these apartments once they find out they can't go out 192 because they're going to be sitting there, can't get out of the traffic. So my concern is, Seminole is a 25 mile an hour street. And I've noticed many times the sheriffs are sitting there writing tickets. Is this going to impact them because these new residents are going to be flying up and down these roads trying to get out? And these roads have speed bumps in these neighborhoods just because of that problem to slow people down. Right. So with all this new people coming through that are saying, well, I don't know, you're going to have 600 people. It's going to make it a lot worse. And the sheriff's going to be more busier writing more tickets which is going to be taking them away from taking care of other serious projects they need to be taken care of. Right. So my concern is, is a lot of people go up and down Milwaukee. They run, they walk, they ride bicycles. And we've already had one person got killed on Milwaukee up by Minton about four years ago. And there's been many times there's been near accidents on Milwaukee and on Henry. And Henry is not very wide to start taking people out of that neighborhood to get them down to Minton to get out. So that's my concern is the roads that we have now are not sufficient to carry the traffic we have now. Now you want to dump more people on them that can't handle it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Marguerite Vincent, 2223 Melbourne Drive, Melbourne, Florida, or excuse me, Merlin Drive, Melbourne, Florida. I know you're a zoning committee, and I understand your purpose. When I look at this community that, you're, that they're looking to rezone, I'm not against apartments, but this is not the right location for apartments. It should be maybe down towards 95 or on the bigger areas where it's not in the middle of this community. So I really hope that you take that into consideration because, like they said, we have mamas and chickens and, and it, it's, it's a community. It's not a, and if you look even in subdivisions, people don't use their garages and they have two, five, two to five cars. Well, you're getting 187 new units and you're going to have 
tons more cars, not just one per unit. And I just want you to take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're already getting messed up, aren't we? <laughs> My name is Fred Mullins. Oh, you're not talking? You're not going to speak? Okay. My name is Fred Mullins. I live at 2155 Feast Road. That's one street over from the development. I was here in 99 when Kane's Furniture conceded to build this store and make that entire area undeveloped. That's the way it was supposed to be back in 99. That happened because of the fiasco with Lowe's and all the stuff they promised and never delivered on. So let's make them live up. Live up to the binding agreement. It's supposed to remain undeveloped. Leave it that way. Scott Shopke, 2245 Pine Meadow Avenue. I'd like to thank you guys for being here. Uh, there's not a lot of glory or praise in doing what you guys do. Not I'm at sure. all. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty tough. Uh, anyway, uh, in a little over three weeks, we've collected over 600 signatures from the neighborhood. We have signed petitions. They're copied. Uh, I don't know if you guys want them or if we give them to the Board of Commissioners, but um, uh, to say the least, uh, there's significant opposition to what you guys or what these guys are developing to bring into uh, our community. Um, let me read something to you. Whereas developer owner desires to develop the property as commercial and pursuant to the Brevard County Code section 621157, and whereas as part of the plan for development of the party, developer owner wishes to mitigate negative impact on abutting landowners and affected facilities or services. This is the developer. This is Keynes, okay? And in other words, you know, they chose to mitigate negative impact. Just in case you guys still wondered, Keynes is still there. Keynes is still doing business on the doorstep of our neighborhood. That mitigation should still be in place as long as Keynes is doing business on our doorstep. Um, Mr. Hoppergarden, you asked earlier about binding land development plans and how can you enforce them? You, sir, are how we enforce them, okay? I mean, that's it. That was a deal they made, okay? And that deal was to prevent commercial spread into our neighborhood, exactly the type of commercial spread that we're talking about here today. I'm pretty sure that you guys are aware that you're under no obligation to re recommend this uh, request. Um, you know, we've looked over it upside down and sideways, and there's no legal requirement for it. You know, this is a choice that you guys are going to make here today, whether or not you're going to support the petitioner's request to put this kind of zoning into our neighborhood. Um, it's unprecedented, and quite simply, it's just not going to fit in our neighborhood. Um, regarding that traffic study, um, I didn't hear any mention about the school on the corner of 192 and uh, Seminole Boulevard. Every morning, cars back up parked on the side of Seminole Boulevard for about 300 yards. Okay, every morning and every night. Did the traffic Let's study? Let's just have one person speaking, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, did, did anybody address that? Did anybody um, look at that school that's already existing that's already clogging up the street? Um, I think that that's a miss. Um, I think that the information that they put uh, before you guys today is incomplete. Uh, hopefully you guys will reject the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mitch Miller. I have a protected address, but I do live on Feast Road, which is right next to the property. Um, he kind of stole my thunder, but uh, I still think the BDP should be enforced. Um, as far as the four acres, I think the four acres should be right in the middle of the property. That's the way it is. Also, one last thing. If we go on uh, models, which seems to be all their information, Florida would be underwater by now. Just saying. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. May I, if I could use this map here. Hold on one second, please. We're going right down that rose, ma'am, from the front to the rear. 
Hi. Hello, my name is Craig Scarlett. I live at 3285 Milwaukee. Uh, there was a great point about that school there. Uh, there is no light at Seminole and uh, 192. To go west at 192 at Seminole is a, is a risk. You have to really plan that out because the traffic's moving quite fast. It's 45, we're only 25 on our road. Most people will opt to do a U-turn and come back, but if you don't, you're, you're, you're at quite a risk. I'm going to try to show you here. Um, it's right here. And it's just uh, one way either way. The other options to getting out of the neighborhood is to go Seminole to Henry and then down by the police department down there to try to get out. Very busy there as well. The, it's, it's, this project is stuffing too much into a really tiny spot. And no, I don't think anybody would object to a brand new home going in there or somebody making a piece of property. But it's just way too much stuff for that little spot that's already jammed. And um, I think it would be wonderful if you would side with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. How do you do? My name is Larry Hinkey. I'm at 2205 Commodore Boulevard. Uh, I also own another property in the neighborhood. I don't know if you need that or not. But So for me, I have um, one thing I want to say is, John, I want to thank you for really focusing on the BDPs and worry. Because, you know, I looked up the mission for the county commissioners and, and their stuff. And, and part of what's in there is creating, I'm going to read the whole thing, but creating cooperative partnerships with some businesses things and mostly residents okay um, honesty is in there about core values so if the BDP is there I have to disagree our neighborhood has not changed in 30 years to the point where we need apartments um, but the the integrity of, of this of what you do here every day you know and it's concerning because there's a handful of BDPs that got lifted or waived or whatever the right terminology is today not one time did anybody ask what it was in place for or when was it put in place. Maybe you know and you just didn't say. I hope so. It's all in our pack. We know. Okay. All right. Good. That's good. That's reassuring because, <laughs> you know, to be able to just make them go away is, it's a little, uh, it's a little concerning. Um, one thing, the, the, uh, with all due respect, the, the traffic, the arrows with the show, the percentage is way off because uh, you got how many, how many apartments are in this place? There's a buttload of kids are going to be in there. All right, and you've got to go left on Seminole to go to Meadow Lane, which I don't think anybody's ever concerned. I think you already said it, but Meadow Lane is at capacity. Central is at capacity. And the thing is, this, this is going to be within two miles. And Florida has a two-mile rule that's ridiculous. Kid, thousands of kids get hurt every year because they have to go to school. They can't ride a bus. This isn't within that two miles. They're going to have to get a ride. They can't ride a bus. So they're going to have to walk where there's no sidewalks, no nothing down on Milwaukee, which is where everybody walks. And this time of year, everybody knows that sun is right in your eyes. So um, one thing is, uh, she said also, you, 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 there's no intent to, to, to harm the neighborhood. Well, you can't do one of these things and not do the other. You're either going to build this stuff and you're going to harm the property because it is going to affect our property values. It's going to crime. No disrespect. I don't want to judge people, but apartments is a little different than homeowners. Okay? It's not... I'm not trying to be mean. You know, everybody's got a place to live. But it is. It simply is. Um, that's um, uh, one last thing. Uh, people work at the Cape, north of Grum, they're not going to live in these apartments. <laughs> they may live in the ones you guys talked about earlier, the luxury apartments, but they're not living here. All right. Okay. That, that's, that's the last thing I got. All right. All right. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I if if I can make a suggestion that helps speed up the the um, public comment, if if we can have some folks set up on the side, that way we can keep this going faster. You want to create a line? Yeah, just a queue. That way, people aren't. We don't need to wait. We can just kind of like as a. Yeah, I Sir, Mark, do you want to start the line right over there? Okay. Well, if. Whoever, <clears throat> whoever would like to talk, if you would, just start coming down and forming a line along that wall so we can go and just keep going. Okay. 
Okay. Jeff. Do we operate under Robert's rules? Can I call a question here and we can shut this thing down and maybe everybody wants to put down for it without having to go through this? No, we have. We do? Yes. Right. Well, they have to have a chance to remodel. All of the offices. That's true. I think what he's saying is that the Okay, ma'am, we're going to start with you. Go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Brenda Piccarillo. I live at 2470 Vermont Street. I am a newer resident to the, Vermont, to the June Park area. I've only been there five years. However, I am here to speak out on behalf um, as well as the, the elderly and the ill neighbors who have reached out to me who could not be here today. Um, from our over 700, not 600, we got a ton more today, 700 si signatures and petitions on average a neighbor in June Park has lived in their property for around 37 plus years, many multiple generations, which I, uh, which I would like to have this entered into the record today of all the signatures. Some are parents and some are children that live next door to each other. Some even live and leave and come back to the neighborhood to raise their kids or to retire. According to the national survey that I looked up, an average person lives in an apartment complex for 2.5 years. That is not even one-tenth of the average citizen in the June Park area. Are you guys aware of the school? You are now. On Seminole and 192, there is a private school that uses Seminole as their access for drop off and pick up. There is no bus. Over 50 plus cars from this school line up twice a day along Seminole Road directly across from the proposed new entrance and now the entrance has been moved north which means it's even closer to the school which, has, which was not mentioned today in the traffic study or was it? I missed it. Um, when I spoke to the Bavaro County Traffic Engineering Department on Friday, I spoke to them directly, a traffic survey has not been approved nor even reviewed by them, which means we do not know what they will force this complex to do on this road to help accommodate all of the new traffic. How can a board like you make a recommendation when you don't have all of the information from all the departments? Lastly, on our meeting on December 14th, it was noted not once, but multiple times by Mr. Terwilliger, which we do have videotaped, and I was asked, or I was actually almost forced to not be able to videotape by their attorney who threatened to call the sheriff on me, and also Bruce Moyer, that a flood survey would not be conducted unless or until after rezoning has been approved because they don't want to spend the money. <coughs> Again, I'm not quite sure how all of you here today can really make a recommendation without having all of the information and facts, plus to have your county people, uh, the appropriate departments, review, make recommendations, and approve or disapprove what is proposed. Again, I ask all of you here today, please vote no on the rezoning and not recommend the changes. I specifically moved to June Park from here to Jokes, if you know where that is, it's across Mitten Road in a subdivision. I chose to move there because I knew what I was going into. I've had four ducks and three dogs and a cat. We have bobcat that run in our neighborhood and, and we have coyotes and they're all coming in closer and closer because of this exact thing. We're asking you please to preserve what little piece of, of, of heaven that we have because yes, June Park is a piece of heaven. Thank you. Thank you. Name and address, please, for the record. My name is Scott Wiederman. I'm with the firm of Wiederman Malik, 1990 West New Haven. A um, couple quick things. The, the, the local resident side you're clearly getting. Let me give a couple of legal sides that are certainly worth consideration. You all are the advisory board to the commission. So yeah. that totality of information is going to be invaluable, and you can use your common sense your common knowledge I know some people I've been in front of for 25 years now just like the rest of the group um, and seen all the faces but let's go through a, one of the big ones the binding development plan Kane's furniture got into that agreement to specifically only have low residential density within this area Kane's furniture now is changing that and now we're gonna look at just compatibility and that's the only issue I'm gonna bring up today for you guys compatibility BU1 isn't compatible with multifamily anywhere they wanted to come up and the applicant said very clearly, here's what we could do, and boy, you shouldn't want that. Problem is, that's what's there now. If that's what they want to do, then this group and the people that you see behind me are probably going to have to sit back and allow for some sort of storage or some sort of whatever else, and that may be the case. 
Second part is, is in any of the county's roadways for multifamily residential, the minimum allowable width of the hard pan road must be over 22 feet, must be 22 feet. Seminole is 20 feet, 20.57 I think it is when you look it up particularly, and Feast Road is even smaller than that. And there's not a single thing that has been brought forth to show that the applicant is even determined if they have the width, the roadway, and the condition to do what's planned. So you all as the advisors to the commission have to ask yourself, if this is never even going to get built because the roadways won't handle it, what are we here asking for as applicants in the first place? Um, second, when you're dealing with um, administrative policy three and four, uh, read specifically in that the question becomes is based on density, what is going to be the proposed use that is not material or adversely impacting an established residential neighborhood by introducing types of intensity of traffic, including but not limited to volume, time, traffic activity, types of vehicles, et cetera, criteria, parking, trip generation, et cetera. I don't know how you get trip generation that goes down when you're adding number of units, but we're not talking about just that. Amazon, UPS, postal service, deliveries for food. We're talking about a roadway that A, isn't compatible as we sit here today and can't be quite frankly at this point with the traffic generation of 130 additional units is allowed right now, 58 units allowed. And we want to get rid of a binding development plan and put Res 215 on it that allows for almost 200 units, 180 some odd units. Staff report more than five times specifically says that there's, um, the staff report specifically talks about how you're going to be introducing Hold on medium density. Are sure. you speaking for? Uh, well, I, <coughs> I have many of the folks. I have six, and if I can have just a few more moments, I'll. Well, I'll the reason sit I'm down. asking is because I can't do it for one and uh, not do it for the other. Understood. Because, and I don't want to get going there. Trust me. <laughs> so, so, hold on. Now, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four. Five, I promise six. I will not be speaking for an hour. Well, well wait a minute. <laughs> if he's going to speak for everyone with their hands up, then you're not going to be able to speak for yourself. So if you want to raise your hands, and Mr. Wiederman is willing to speak for all of them. I, I have no problem speaking for at least a few of them. And I really, I, again, Please understand, there's not much more to take into consideration well, but the I've, compatibility. I've but got a question for staff here real quick. We need a cue, and we're going to be lo losing her. She needs to leave. And you still have, you still have a quorum, still, still Mr. Chair. Does any other board members have any prior commitments? I have to leave at 6. You have to leave at 6. So that still leaves. So we would still, even if Pete leaves, we would still. Yeah, we can keep going, and then depending on who has to leave, we'll keep taking a, a tally to say. No, Mr. Uh, if Alex, got a legally. Yes, sir. I've never been in this situation. All right. So how do we, how do we let Mr. Wiederman, who do we delineate? The people that raise their hands, can you all move to the back of the room, knowing that you're not going to speak? Well, if we want to pass around like a, a sign-in sheet or something to that effect. A, si a sign in sheet so those individuals can write down their name and then he can speak on their behalf. That way we can keep track of who's being spoken for. Two or three minutes. Uh, really How much really more time do you need? I, I need two or three minutes. Let's, really let's vote on how much minutes. extension. I, I, I don't want to get into okay, too much. Okay, we don't want to get into a logistics one issue person. here. <laughs> oh, hold on one second, Dan. I, you're going to help us out here, Mr. Wiederman. Right. You just didn't know it. <laughs> okay. Those that have respectfully raised their hands, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him 10 minutes to talk. So I'm not going to send a paper back there and have you move back. But if we are going to let Mr. Wiederman speak for y'all, please don't come down the line and talk to because he's going to cover everything. And I, there was some of y'all over here that did not raise their hand. You know, you still have the right to talk. You know, but we've had 15 or 20 people speak, and the only thing we're hearing right now is traffic. So I know that's a major issue. I was actually born in the police foundation. So, but anyhow, uh, we got to try to get through this. And Mr. Wiederman, thank you for, yes. you just got 
500 more customers, so. <laughs> I'm thinking they're all hoping it doesn't happen that way, but I hear you. I all right, know. so we're gonna let Mr. Wiederman speak. I'm gonna give you 10 minutes. All right, so let me back up a couple of steps, but again, I'm still not really sure that that total time's necessary, but let me, let me back up to a couple because of the speed. We're gonna things. give it to you anyway. All if right. you use it, Fair use enough. it. If Fair you enough. don't, we'll knock it off. <clears throat> So let's back up then real quick um, to the binding development plan. The whole purpose of the RU, R17, um, basically, again, now let's deal with compatibility. You have single family residents on basically over a quarter acre lots. Correct. And that's it surrounding the area. Um, that was the specific deal in the binding development plan in order to create Kane's furniture and then to create the rest of the property for June Park to be what it is. Um, the question is going to become, as I know one of those previous speakers brought up, how do you justify that change with the continued and same use that's still going on there? And I think that will be important for the, for the board by your recommendation to understand. Um, we then got to go down some of the staff report stuff in, in particular, and one of the biggest questions is going to be the utilities and the use of utilities for this project. We're going to have 200, 180 some odd units. Um, and again, if we use the whole June Park area, you've got the city of Melbourne and the city of West Melbourne as utilities. Now, I understand and I believe it's in your packet, nobody's even talked to either of those entities, especially West Melbourne, which is the only place they're gonna be able to get sewer from. And nobody's talked to them at all as to whether or not they can even hook up to the city of West Melbourne for sewer at this point. Now, I don't know how every time that the facilities get used in a 180 plus unit project, they're gonna need sewer by the city of West Melbourne. The nearest other is going to be a good ways away with the city of Melbourne. So we're still here contemplating this theoretical development project where we all know theory can hang an elephant in the Grand Canyon by its tail, uh, you know, by a daisy. The problem is, is that we know the daisy in our, in our capacity as humans isn't gonna hold up the elephant and they're gonna go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The question that you all have to do by your vote in advising the board is whether or not all of the conditions that you all in granting or giving your, your blessing to go forward with this proposal can or should be or have been met. The traffic issue you've heard about, the width of the road you've heard about, the utilities now you've heard about, the question then becomes compatibility in a complete residential district where you have quarter acre lots and the R4, and, and as, as Mr. Zanka had stated, you got 5,000 square foot lots. This multifamily residential is not currently compatible with the zoning conditions when you get to the administrative analysis policies that talk about Will it be compatible with the neighborhood? The staff report paragraph on page seven, the last paragraph, the board may wish to consider if the request is consistent and compatible with the surrounding areas with the introduction of RU215. There is none in the area. How can it be compatible? And we know the city of Melbourne, closer towards 95, has some multifamily residential, and there are plenty of other places that do. Compatibility with June Park and the surrounding area is gonna be your question mark. Compatibility with that with dealing with schools, traffic study, the intensity of the roadways. You have the voice to start the process for these people who I'm sure are all gonna show up at the commission meeting. And as well, you can tell, there's plenty of spirit here. No, they need to. <laughs> they do need to. They need to. <clears throat> but the, the, the recommendation of this board in going through all of those policies ah. is the starting point. Right. Theory doesn't create a multifamily residential area. Theory doesn't get us there. Actuality does. And the actual intensity allowed with what's there now is 58 units. And this board gets to determine if 130, uh, 130 more units is compatible with single family residential on all sides except for 192. And we all know 192 is a big business area. Right. Um, I would suggest that from a compatibility perspective in just dealing with the staff reports on the um, policies one through six, do not make this compatible at all with this area. And that is where you guys should keep uh, your thought process. Thank you. Okay.
you all for sharing us today. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Carolyn Bevel. I live at 2405 uh, Cottonwood. Can you hear me? Do you want me to repeat yeah, yeah, myself? Please. Oh. Thank you all for hearing everybody today. Um, my name is Carolyn Bevel, and I live at 2405 Cottonwood Avenue in June Park. Um, uh, my husband and I are homeowners in June Park. My family owns Emma's Flowers off of Minton Road in Milwaukee and have been residents in June Park for over 27 years. We use Seminole Boulevard every day. I respectfully ask that there be no changes in the zoning in June Park, specifically to the land surrounding Kane's Furniture. Sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, this rezoning is not a request by the surrounding community. The development is not providing a service that the community needs or has requested. By potentially rezoning this land, Kane's and the Brevard County Commissioners would be breaking the original BDP agreement that was made to not develop this land in our neighborhood for uses such as this. This promise was made to many of the longtime residents that you see here, along, to my, along um, with my family, um, just like we were discussing earlier. Uh, rezoning should not be granted without demonstration of extenuating circumstances that will benefit the surrounding community. I have a few points that I'd like for you to consider. Um, number one, the history. June Park was established in 1925 and should be respected as part of the heritage of Brevard. It has a unique rural environment that provides homes and residents to a very diverse wildlife. Um, the destruction of this rural aspect will displace all of this wildlife, um, as well as strip the biodiverse ecology that benefits us all in fil filtering our groundwater and supporting the bees and other pollinators. A paved over apartment complex will not benefit our community or our environment. I think I'm gonna go over. Um, number two, neighborhood desirability. The demographics at June Park are wealthy, educated professionals, small business owners, engineers, government workers, executives, and managers who were drawn to our neighborhood by the single family owner occupied medium to large homes. Based on that desirability, NeighborhoodScout.com ranks June Park as better than 91% of the neighborhoods in Florida. According to Niche.com, June Park ranks eight for the best places to buy a house in Florida. People relocate to provide for jobs, but they choose June Park based on factors that will adversely be affected by this rezoning, specifically spot rezoning. Um, would I be able to finish? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can I? All right. Oh. Well, thank you. And ma'am, thank you for being respectful to the time. Good evening at this point. Uh, my name is Tara Miller. I live at 2240 Pine Meadow Avenue. Um, I've just moved to the June Park area about two years ago for many of the reasons that everyone has discussed today. I am officially opposed to this large apart apartment complex being developed in the area. Uh, one thing is trust. At that recent meeting, December 14th, the engineering firm and developer left the community with more questions and concerns than presenting actual facts. Initially, they verbally said to the residents that the water drainage assessment deemed there would be no additional drainage impacts to his existing residential properties. However, when I spoke with the engineer one-on-one -on -one after most people left, he told me they haven't done any water drainage assessment yet, that they wouldn't spend that type of money unless they know the land will be rezoned and they're going to move forward with the property. This proves to me that they're not acting in good faith and are definitely not looking out for our community. They were just trying to smooth things over and get us on their side. If you look at the current zoning and existing developed properties along 192, it's all commercially zoned and developed as we're talking today. Um, there's established precedent for commercially, commercially zoned businesses, not large apartment complexes. As others have mentioned, there's plenty of other lots for sale in the Melbourne area, specifically out west of 95, where a lot of growth and development is already existing. 
These developers are looking to build an apartment complex and then flip it and sell it as soon as they can. This was one of the things that came up at that, at that December meeting on how long do they keep it. And they admitted after they reach a, reach a certain capacity, they look to flip it and sell it. So they're saying that they're targeting these this specific rent cost and clientele, but there's no guarantee that that is going to be what exists in the future. Um, as others have mentioned, traffic along, traffic along 192 in the morning and evenings is already congested. Um, as others have mentioned, trying to make a left off of Seminole onto New Haven is difficult. Personally, I avoid this intersection as much as possible. I choose to go west down Miami to Wood, which, where it's easier to make a left on 192. I'm assuming others will do that as well. Finally, precedent. If this property rezoning is approved, I'm afraid this sets a dangerous precedent for other developers to come in and propose similar apartment complexes on the remaining land along 192. Not only does this project add an additional 300 cars daily to the already congested roadways, but it could be a gateway for many more apartments and hundreds, maybe even a thousand additional cars along 192. If this is approved, any future developer will use this approval as an arguing point as to why you should approve future requests. Finally, I'm firmly opposed to this project proposal and ask that you deny its recommendation. Hello, my name is Susan Croft and I live at 2140 Feast Road. My husband and I spearheaded an informational distribution campaign across June Park to help augment the petition campaign that Brenda and Scott put together, and we talked to many residents across June Park. Our backyard ends at the property of Kane's property. I'm speaking here today to respectfully remind this board of the binding development plan signed by Kane Furniture Corporation in 1999. The same conditions present at that time when that important promise was made is still in place unaltered to this day. We purchased a one-of-a-kind home built in 1964 that is a typical June Park house, and we have lived there happily for 24 years. We are the second owner of this home. When we work on it, we try to honor the the original builder's vision to it, a man who designed and built it, raised a family in it, and lived there till he died. This is a community of mostly homeowners just like us, often with generous lots and semi-rural conditions, who care just as deeply about their homes as we do ours. This proposal by the Terwilliger brothers is a complete and utter mismatch to the generous lots, oh sorry, to the deeply established community by any measure as you've already heard from many others. There's also many areas where this is a perfect match for, including the zoning as Tara just pointed out. If this proposal passes, it will create an unprecedented change in the character of the area. This, for example, Although we don't hear roosters from our back deck, we will not be hearing the mooing cows that we hear. And the reason why is because a three-story building will be smack dab against our property, blocking out the abundant peace and quiet, sunlight and privacy. You wish for your privacy to be respected, I imagine, and you wish for your financial investment to be protected. This will remove both for us, and June Park objects. Please honor the binding development plan and decline this applicant's request for changes. Thank you. My name is Michael Croft and I live at 2140 Feast Road. Uh, as a homeowner with property adjacent to Kane property, my wife and I respectfully request the following uh, under the terms of the binding development plan. This development is restricted to two-story only for less people, less traffic, less noise, and less parking, and less flooding potential. The current env environment report was done by a third-party company. The current environment report needs to be redone by a third-party company instead of the one owned by Mr. Moria who sits on an engineering firm and is hired by the developer and sits on the board. This action will reduce some of the obvious conflict of interest. The flood drainage study 
needs to be done and available prior to the voting changes, <coughs> changing this uh, um, appropriate consideration for all the, uh, uh, we have a Brownville, Brownfield site at the end of our property, at the end of our street. It's off, just off 192 and Feast Road. It's been neglected and, and, and swept under the rug. No one's done anything about it, but it's still there. It was done by FIT and the government putting lead and different chromiums in the ground. They filled up a pond that was right behind it with dirt in, in a couple years ago, and it, no one has, no, no one has done anything to clean that up, and then went and put an apartment complex 75 feet from it. I mean, no one's brought this up because most people don't know about it because you can't find it on, on the internet anymore. Um, I hope I made myself clear, and uh, I, I want to just say a, a, a few things about traffic. Uh, I, I'm a retired truck driver. I've been all over the country. And uh, the company I worked for would fire you if you got in an accident making U-turns on a highway. But the state of Florida took all these intersections just about on 182 and made U-turns, which I don't know if you guys are scared about making a U-turn in front of traffic, but I am. And you want, the traffic from these, uh, this apartment complex is going to increase it. 192 is going to be re, re uh, tore up in just a couple months, and they're going to—I don't know what they're going to do to it, but they're going to put extra drainage and such in. But they're not going to widen it. They're not going to put extra sidewalks in it. They're not going to put extra lighting in it. They're just going to put some bushes in it. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen Clark and I live at 2035 Wood Street. I just heard someone mention Wood Street as an alternative to turn left instead of going out of Seminole because 192 is nuts. This is something that I haven't heard anyone bring up yet, but the 192 corridor from I-95 to Mitten Road is the third biggest traffic accident area in Brevard County. That was a couple years ago before we have all this additional uh, business. Now, right at the end of my street, uh, Wood Street, there's the patio store. I love the patio store. You know, nobody comes down Wood Street, they go to the patio store, they buy stuff, and they get back on 192. <coughs> Our biggest concerns, of course, are the traffic. I walk my dogs. There are no sidewalks out here in June Park. And I, I actually go walking down um, Seminole there in Milwaukee, and I've just about gotten run over multiple times something someone else didn't bring out either. We have, a, we have horses. We are an equestrian area. People ride their horses out there. How do you think 187 apartment complex, and if it's $2,000 a month rent, you've got to make $6,000 a month to qualify for that. Well, I'm sorry, but that's basically three people working full time to try to make that rent. So you think that 600 cars, I don't know where the 600 to 100 happen, but my math isn't that bad. I'm sorry, there's going to be so much traffic on these tiny roads, there's gonna be people and animals hurt. We, I'm on a third acre, you know, th this is just not compatible. It, we're not against growth, okay? I put a commercial whatever on 192. And then the, the other one, there's that binding agreement, you know? Respect that binding agreement. Figure out something that's going to work better for our community. This is just way too dense. And it's not gonna be safe for our community. There isn't, it, it just doesn't work for us. So please go ahead and build some commercial on 192. We understand that. but adding that other 187 just doesn't work for us. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Cindy Baguette. I'm at 3730 Miami. I've lived there for about six years and I'm also speaking on behalf of my parents on Cory Avenue. I've been living in the neighborhood for over 31 years. So 
I hear all this stuff about traffic and it's just absolutely not true. So 192 does get congested to where everybody goes through our neighborhood. I see people speeding. I've had my own doctors, not recent doctors, doctors that I work for everybody tell me, oh, I've seen this at your house because everybody cuts there through there just to get to 95. It's faster, I get it, but they're speeding. I've seen also emergency personnel speeding through there. So it's definitely not a safe hey, place. Favorite. Can we hold up out there and so everyone can hear here, please? Sorry. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, it's, it's a high traffic. I've never felt comfortable with like just letting kids play in the front yard. Um, like I said, that you're speeding there, they'll go down Wood Street so they can get to 95 or they'll go down as far as Arizona or I forget what it's called now, city. And to get to 95 and same vice versa same to come back through the other way Miami is a very heavy traffic yes. due to all of that and so is Seminole so that's all I have to say all right I, thank you I'm not gonna talk about traffic <laughs> <laughs> well, I need your name and address for the record. I'm Christina Crosby. I live at 2240 Seminole Boulevard, and I've lived there for over 20 years. I moved into that area because I love the area. I want you to know that the area was, was platted back in 1913, and it's been a beautiful place to live for a long time. The oldest, the, 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 most of the residents have lived there 30, 40, 50 years. What you guys don't understand is these houses were built mostly in the 50s. Every time a new house or somebody tears down a house and puts another house in, you flood the whole neighborhood because the new, the new zoning codes require that everything be built up. This is gonna be built up, they admitted during the meeting we had before, at least 18 inches higher than the roadway. The roadway has been, since I've lived there, paved once in over 20 years, okay? I have to call Public Works just to come out there to empty out the storm drains because it floods after every time it rains more than 20 minutes. That, that I can't walk my dog safely down Seminole Boulevard in the middle of the afternoon because I'm dodging cars that are going to Palm Bay, that's irrelevant. What I'm trying to tell you is you're going to change the whole face of the neighborhood. You're going to make the property values go down. And no offense to these people, but that binding agreement was put there for a reason. We want the neighborhood to stay the same. We have no problem with all these people coming in. And everybody that here that they, you know, that report that they referred to back from 2012 saying that we need all these apartments and stuff for professionals, I worked at Northrop Grumman. I worked at Lockheed Martin. I have worked for the county. Nobody I know wants to live in an apartment. They all want single family homes. That's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, or I guess evening by now, right? Um, my name is Melissa Weber. I live at 7801 Henry Avenue, which is right on the corner where Seminole comes on to Henry. Um, I live there with my husband and our two small children. Um, eight years ago, we realized our dream of home ownership when we purchased our home built in the 1920s in June Park. We've invested our time and money into renovating and restoring our family home. And I know y'all have heard about the traffic. I don't have this man's pedigree when it comes to traffic, but I will tell you five days a week, we take our two children to the local elementary school that is over capacity and that less than one mile round trip takes over 30 minutes. I know that they did a traffic study. I'm concerned that it didn't also include the Minton corridor. Corridor because as you turn off of Seminole, you can go right onto 192 or you can go left and that will take you to Henry to Minton. And I think that that's an issue that they need to address. Um, I realize you guys know by now, it's in direct conflict with the neighbors. We're all here, you've heard the petition. Um, the one thing that um, nobody here has pointed out is that when the developers hosted the informational meeting, the notice that I received or that I saw that was posted had the wrong date and year on it. And so to me, this distribution of misinformation communicates that either they're not willing to meet with us and make the effort or um, they're just not willing to follow the guidelines of this rezoning process. And so I think that's an important issue to know that if you're gonna put stipulations where they need to meet with us to make um, concessions or whatever that may be future, they put out misinformation about those meetings so that who knows why, but that was there. Um, Current zoning would allow the landowner to build homes consistent with the current neighborhood. And let me be clear, I'm not opposed to development. All of these people that we've talked about, young professionals like myself, like my husband, who are coming into this area, although my husband is a lifelong Brevard County resident, so I think I am too now. Um, all of these people coming in will eventually want 
single family homes. And that's what can be built here and help other Brevard County residents and young families realize that dream of home ownership. Um, Re, I'm, re, I am asking this board to recommend denying this rezoning application because a change to this type of high density zoning will harm the existing community residents who the county commissioner represents. And it goes against the binding land agreement. This developer will be here today with promises and gone tomorrow while those of us who have invested our time and our money into these properties will be here for many years to come. Thank you. My name is Vin Bepler. I live at 2655 Center Street. And uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, this, this neighborhood here is, you know, it's more of a community. I moved into this neighborhood because of the neighbors. Uh, they're what they watch over each other. When you bring into a big multi motel like or, or apartment house like this, you lose that. And, you know, it's a very established, a very solid neighborhood. Everybody gets along. You know, we have our little feuds, but it's a community. It's not, it's not just an apartment building where people go to work and come home. And you can't change things like this because, you know, everybody today, they think we're a democracy, okay? We're not a democracy. We're a constitutional republic, which means you people work for us. And the whole thing about everything you do is supposed to be about we the people, for the people, and by the people. So, you know, it's our homes, leave us alone. Don't be interested in making more money for, the, for these creeps, you know, they're, they're just, they're here to rape us and move on. We stay here, you know, this is our home. My wife was born and raised in Brevard. You know, I just, I don't understand why so many people are willing to just let things happen instead of realizing that you people are supposed to be here to protect us. You're supposed to look out for our best interests. Not their best interest, our best interest. And if you don't start doing that, I mean, this, this whole place is gonna go to crap. So, you know, live a good life. You know, I, I'm an ex-vet. I, I did my, my time in the military. I traveled to 59 countries. I know what socialism is, and that's where we're heading. You know, they want us not to own homes. They want us all to be in apartment houses. I'm not willing to do that. I wanna raise a family in a home and I, I want the next family to have the same rights I did. And if you take away our right to our pursuit of happiness in a good, solid neighborhood where our neighbors talk to each other, we have barbecues at each other's house and bonfires at each other's house, and you want to make it to where everybody just walks by each other. They don't say hello, they don't do nothing. And that's wrong. This is a very stable and unique neighborhood, and it should stay just like it is, and you guys are the stakeholders that'll make it happen or not. And I, I hope you all do the right thing. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, I'm Dr. Jerry Nessler. I live at 2700 New York Street, West Melbourne, Florida. Um, two things, one of them, yes, the traffic, and I agree with most of what they're saying. A couple of things on the traffic that you may remember is where Henry meets Seminole. Beautiful little, uh, little turn there. No, it's all messed up. So, I mean, that's one thing that I don't think was addressed as well as, like somebody else pointed out, yeah, these people are going to circumvent away from 192. They're going to go to, is it Miami, that goes up to Wood, and what's the next one, Alma? Yeah, and uh, and Milwaukee. they're, they're going to get out, because somebody else pointed out, there's only like eight exits on 192, and there's only a couple of them that head to 95. So there's all kinds of craziness that happens there. So, okay, I think that horse is dead. The second thing that I wanted to point out was the density study that they have. Uh, I don't know if it was put out uh, in the last six months or a year, but just go down Minton right on the other side of 95 that they've just clear lotted for another big, huge complex. And you guys probably had to come about some meetings and some No, that's stuff. Palm Bay. That's Palm Bay. Okay, well, and that's, that's kind of my point. Across the street on Minton, again, it's Palm Bay, where they're flooded with apartment complexes that are just huge. And like these guys have said, we really don't want that in our neighborhood. So I just want to point out that I don't think their study about we need more apartments in our little neck of the woods there. I think we're fine because even on the other side of 95, they're putting apartments too. So again, 
county, Palm Bay, city, I don't know. But I just want to make sure that you guys take that in consideration. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Renee Weibelt, and I live at 2246 Arizona Street, and I am in the real estate field. I've been a closing agent for uh, 37 years um, in Brevard County. I've lived here pretty much all my life, and I will tell you that while she says that from Palm Bay to Titusville is the growth corridor, uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of growth over you know the years that I've been here, although the luxury apartments, as they're saying it, which they'll sell later on, and it won't be so luxury. Um, the average income of seventy to ninety thousand that they're saying is going to live in there, that's just not going to happen. Seventy to ninety thousand income, they're buying a house. They're not spending time in a luxury apartment. Um, also, as we all know, and we've seen in the past. Apartment complexes do bring down values of neighborhoods, whether it's a luxury apartment or not a luxury apartment. They just bring down the values. And people have spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars fixing their properties up, making them look the way that they want in that area. Um, and we don't need the property values being brought down due to the fact that a developer wants to make 400000 a month in rents income. Um, so, and then, of course, in reference to crime, you know, that could bring more crime in our area. Uh, we tend to, homeowners keep their properties up, usually homeowners uh, tend to rally together, like we are here. A lot of, and I'm not saying that every renter's not good, you know, in keeping things needy and tidy, but on the average, they don't keep up things. Um, I do a lot of closings on apartment complexes, and I, I see the pictures, and they're horrible when they're resold and stuff. People don't keep them up. So we do not want this in our neighborhood or even close to our neighborhood. There's 10,000 acres past 95 where this could go, and that's where there's a 10-year plan out there from what I hear for shopping centers and it's going to be like a Viera and that is where the apartment complex should go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Glenn Williams, 2430 Michigan Street and uh, I was not intending on talking but I couldn't keep myself from it. I did not do a survey on apartments from Jacksonville to Miami or Titusville to Palm Bay. I looked at the four closest apartment buildings, established apartment buildings to June Park. There's 144 vacancies and we're going to build another 180 some odd. They're going to turn that apartment complex so they can make their money. It's just an investment. And that is just the established apartments, not the ones they're building within our area. That's okay. it. Vicki Cash, 2165 Main Street. Um, I've lived there 36 and a half years. I've been in Brevard uh, 50 years. Um, at eight and a half months pregnant, my husband and I rode up and down every single street in the neighborhood because we knew that's the area that we wanted to live. Uh, we were both municipal employees in the utilities divisions and intimately knew what was available in, in all the other areas. Um, on that note, this area is heavily populated by people that have government jobs, municipal, city, um, we are in service just as you people are. Um, I don't have a problem with the business development along 192. That's consistent and appropriate. Um, and houses to be consistent and appropriate in the zoning with the surrounding area, that, that's their right. And we will welcome them with open arms. Um, 
the county zoning map has that uh, the June Park area as platted in 1925. That's two years short of a century. We don't have that much history. This is uh, a unique area, and while it is not a designated historic designation site, I submit that it is, a, in fact, a de facto historical designated, should be designated area, and that we want to keep it that way. Um, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Chair, commissioners. Um, no, not commissioners. I'm sorry, <laughs> board members. Yeah, all right, right. Sorry. sorry about that. Well, I'm used to being here. So. Your oh, name, yeah. name and address for Who the. Who can record. do? But I got. Uh, my name is Ron Story. I'm a trustee representing myself and the uh, my 90 year uh, two year old father, the Stanley Revo uh, Story Re Family Revocable Trust, 7645 Helen Street. Additional properties uh, suppressed under Florida Statute 119.071. Um, <laughs> My dad and I, uh, the trust, owns uh, about seven, seven acres, more or less, within 200 yards of this. It was purchased in 1962. We've had hogs, dogs, chickens, goats, you know, you get it. it this is just not going to fit in, in our neighborhood. Um, I'm not going to share with you this for a resume or anything like that, but just to get the board a little credibility. I was born in District 5, okay? I lived in District 3 for uh, 15 years. I got back to District 5 just as soon as I could. Um, lifelong uh, Bavard County residents. I've had a few TDY deployments where I had to leave, but I've always come back here. I recognize a lot of the names and faces here over the years. So I'm a former appointee to the um, Bavard County Code Enforcement Board uh, before it went to a special master. I enjoyed you know, uh, serving the citizens. Um, I speak in so uh, strong opposition. These are my peeps. You know, so, but um, I'm not going to rehash what everybody said. We, you know, you know what's going on here. But I will mention the sewer issue. They brought that up, and I'm not a civil engineer or anything like that. But West Melbourne provides that sewer in that area, <clears throat> and there's no West Melbourne doesn't butt up against this property. So I don't know if they're going to bore up under the county or whatever like that. I don't know what's going on, but with that, and they bring up the sewer and the septic tank and stuff like that. But they're not hooked to Brevard uh, to West Melbourne, so I don't know how they're going to get the sewer there, and I don't care. But um, uh, last person here that everybody here knows me I'm, I'm the last one to be a tree hugger I've run a Ryan 50 with a root rake you know where I'm going so but I, I got coyotes in my backyard now and it's not the cartoon kind chasing a road runner it's a real coyote and he ain't happy to be there so our, 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 our the, um, the forest and areas like that where these uh, animals can live it's it's quickly going away um, I've heard also the BU1 and, and things like that. I believe some of this property is RU1-7 uh, or something like that. So it's not R, let's not get caught up on that BU1. There's some, there's some residential zoning in there. If we want to know what to do with this, go on Google Earth, look at Pine Meadow, great place. You know, it, it, it could be made like that. Canes, I believe, and I, I, before I walked in the door, I didn't know, I thought it was called a binding land use plan, but I guess it's a binding BDP or whatever like that. If they sign that, have them enforce it. I would appreciate that. All right. Thanks for your time. All right. Good thank you. Thank you. Rob Downey, 5745 Catchput Circle, Town of Melbourne Village. Um, first, I'd like to make you or make you uh, take note of the fact that the attorney was representing a client on Merritt Island and a much bigger project than this and we're coming in for changes and one person showed up. This is a far smaller project and look at the room. I know that it's, a lot of these people have made significant uh, sacrifices to be here today and it filled. And I'm sure that it will when the commission votes on this as well. Um, I'm not as directly um, affected by this as many of the people in the room, although I know many of them. And, you know, they are, they're living out there uh, hoping for a relative solitude, and then this comes along, and it's obviously going to affect some way more than others. I just think about the people that live on Seminole across the street from this and wonder, um, when they bought their properties, they may have known that it was residential, single-family homes across the street that someday would be there. They were not bargaining for this. Um, this is a change in the rules, 
And this is a problem with government. Uh, when governments decide to change the rules because a developer comes along and wants to make a lot of money, and nobody's against making money, but we do object to making money at the expense of other people's solitude and relative solitude that they were looking for when they moved there. And I think you need to be aware of this, that changing the rules is what is a, a big problem in this country right now. We're seeing uh, a lot of dissatisfaction with government. And it's because government does things that the constituents don't like them doing. And so they bring down the wrath of people on them all the time because of you know, wanting to change things because somebody wants to make more money. And that's the bottom line here. Let's face it, guys. They could build apartments somewhere else, but maybe they've got a sweet deal going on here, and they're going to build this one, and they figure that they're going to make more than they will if they build it somewhere else. But they're going to do it at the expense of the people who are already living there. That is not fair. That is not right. That is not what should be going on in this nation, this county, and whatever town you live in. Um, we have to come together at times like this and fight this, make it known to people like yourselves. I mean, I've sat in your position. I, I was the mayor of Melbourne Village for two terms, so I've, you know, I've uh, confronted issues like this myself. Um, and I don't envy your position. This is a much more difficult thing than I think that maybe any of the two terms that I served I had to deal with. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there with 11 seconds to go and let it go on to the next person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else wants to speak? Because I'm seeing there's only one person left. Well, if you want to line up over there, you can start the line, sir. If y'all, whoever wants to speak, if you would, just line up against that wall. How are we doing, sir? Good. My name is John McQueen, and I live at uh, Right. Where do I live? <laughs> I'm losing my mind. That's it. 2100 Feast Road. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time because everybody has rehashed, I think, the feelings of the We've majority of it, us. <laughs> um, but it's important for me to come up here and speak to give my support yes, sir. Uh, to not approve. Um, to have this apartment complex get what they want. All I'm going to say is their attorney mentioned the need for more housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Brevard County, from Titusville to Palm Bay and beyond, is a very big county. There is more than enough land to build apartments that make more sense elsewhere. Look at where they want to build, and like everyone has said, look at the area, and it's out of character for the area. It's not rocket science. That's all I got to say. Okay. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Gina Skinner. I live on Main Street in uh, West Melbourne. My address is officially, though, um, protected. But I just kind of wanted to implore you and let you know that I'm a third generation June Park resident. My grandparents moved and bought the family land where we live now back in the 50s. They specifically bought land out in that area because of the sort of rural atmosphere that is out there, the fact that you could have chickens and hogs and dogs and kids playing in the front yards, and the fact that the streets were quiet and people wanted to be able to live in a place like that. Those houses have, at this point, changed hands many times to our residents now that are here for 20 years or 15 years. Some of our old time residents are still in the area. And so you've heard this evening from all these people that have come and made the effort to have their voices heard, to let you know that they're worried and they're sort of afraid of what is going to happen to our sense of community. We have people in our community, we look out for each other within our street, within our area, and now you're sort of, you have the opportunity to either allow or not allow 
hundreds more people to come in, hundreds of more people on our streets, scaring away our wildlife, taking up somehow some kind of amenities that all of the people in this room love about where we live currently. It also will impact things even greater, bigger than Mitten Road, bigger than 192. You're talking about your schools, you're talking about our power grids at this point, you're talking about our emergency services. People have mentioned a lot of different issues tonight. Please make sure you're not just hearing about the traffic. Although that has been a big one, there are so many other things that really and truly the people of this community are standing together and fighting against, we're opposing because not just for traffic, but all those other issues as well. So please, I implore you to make sure you are keeping the big picture in mind, whether it's the BDU or the BDP or whatever you want to call it from Canes, whether it's the people who live nearby that are going to now experience flooding in their neighborhoods, to the people that are going to now have to be sitting in traffic for a long time getting to school, around the school, wherever they're trying to get to. Okay. Many people at this point, there are lots of opportunities to live elsewhere. The people have chosen to live in this community for those reasons. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, my name's Clyde Worth. I live at 2420 Green Street, June Park. Uh, Mr. Wadsworth, you said you've never seen anything like this before? No, sir, I have not. Obviously, you weren't at the meeting when the county commissioners wanted to run Jupiter Inlet from Palm Bay and deadhead it right into 192. No. Well, no. I talked to the county commissioners earlier that day. They said, oh, this is progress. You've got to get behind it. Five minutes into the meeting, they said, we're not going to do this because these kind of people showed up. Now, if you want to see a bigger crowd, you can move this forward to the county commissioner. <laughs> But obviously we had a lot of people here talk about how much they liked the area there, you know. So if, I know you're familiar with this. You said you grew up in a, a police foundation. But if these other guys would like to drive through there, remember, if you drive through this area, you have to yield to children, dog walkers, bikers, cats, dogs, birds, wildlife, uh, from box turtles to wild boars. You can help the box turtle across the road because he's a little slow. But don't touch the land tortoises, please. Uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that you will not grant them what they want to do. Keep it at single family residence. And if you do, make the recommendation that they extend Miami and bring all that traffic into an intersection instead of what they did here where they wanted to put it and, oh, I have this thing here. When you see one of these things, you know, ask the engineer if he's going to live in that house across from that exit there for 10 years. <laughs> if right. not, you know, you'd be better off just burning it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, before you state your name and address. Now, we're done on this side, is that correct? We're getting closer, board. <laughs> All right. Tracy Anderson, live at uh, 8850 North Indiana Avenue in June Park. Thank you for your time staying late tonight, guys. But with, not much has been touched on the water drainage. I'm a lifelong resident of June Park. I was born there. I'm third generation living there. and. Over the past years, with the development in West Melbourne, with the cow pastures being taken out and the schools being put in and all the neighborhoods, there's no drainage been added for all of that. It's still the same canals that have always been out there. The last two storms, for the first time in my life, I had to sandbag my house. I never had to do that before, ever, in 53 years. I can't raise my house any higher. It's there. It was built in the 50s. I can't put dirt under it and raise it up. So the more these people come in, if they want to do a drainage study, they need big pumps and it's got to go out past 95. If you've ever been to the intersection of 192 and John Rhodes, 
after a thunderstorm, okay? That's a major highway. You can ride a boat across it. And all that water backs up into our neighborhood. And it's incredible. Whole streets will be flooded. So I would hope that y'all would take that in consideration when you make your decision. And thank you for your time. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Ron Vicens. I live at 2030 Seminole Boulevard. Um, been wanting to move to June Park in a country setting for about 15 years now. I've been saving my money and I bought a piece of property three years ago right across from where, where they want to put the exit point. Uh, I got an acre there. Um, I wanted to be around the people in that area. They're great. Um, I checked with plan and zoning for the property behind me before I bought the property and in front of me where they want to put their apartments. And it was saying for single family homes, four per acre. And that was the reason I took my life savings and bought that property and built a new home. And the people I've met there are great. And the other thing, um, for them to change that for anybody in the community is wrong. And the lighting issue would be a fact. Nobody's even talked about that. Three stories high, lighting all night long, which is crazy. And the school that they have behind Lifestyle Homes um, and Lazy Boy, there's 50 cars every morning backed up, goes almost halfway to Henry. Um, for an hour and then from 245 to 345 another 50 cars to pick their kids up and they're not permitted um, They park half on the road and half in the grass and it causes a major backup and you guys already heard about traffic So I won't go into that though, but for the community and the people it should houses should stay there, you know uh, For everybody's sake the people that have been there 30 40 years, so I appreciate you guys looking into this and trying to help us Okay, thank, thank you, you. Ma'am, you're going to need to state your name and address here for the record. Yes, I will. My name is Terry Jansen. My husband and I live at 2265 Commodore Boulevard in West Melbourne. Okay. We've been residents there for 20 years, and we moved there because my parents lived there for 30 years before. I grew up in this area. My dad was at Patrick in 68, so I consider myself a lifelong resident. There have been so many issues raised tonight and I'm not going to go through all of them. Thank you. But <laughs> I just want to remind you, all of you, and thank you and you for being here to remind us what the real purpose is. Nothing wrong with your apartment complex, okay? You're, you have a job to do and you're trying to do your job, okay? The, I understand that the community developers and authorities create zoning ordinances to protect the safety and the peace of the residential areas. I also understand that the master zoning plan was made by competent people to preserve the integrity of West Melbourne. The requester is asking to rezone these properties to a significantly higher density rate where 186 units sharing roughly 12 acres. Okay, we, we know that. Not a good idea. I submit the answer is no, because this is inconsistent with our surrounding areas and our master plan for the area. There are so many factors that affect our neighborhood. Um, I think the one thing that bothers me the most about this is uh, people who live in apartments, they are basically transients. They turn, okay? They, aren't, they don't take pride in owning because they don't own. They're, they're, they are short-term people. Um, many people have brought up the Keynes uh, binding development plan, and I think it is your job and your job, and your job, and your job, and your job to defend us and make them stand by what they said they were going to do for our community. 
Okay, so what other reasons might we have to do this? West Melbourne has a balanced budget. They don't need the extra money. So I implore you guys to deny this application. Thank you. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Margie Brown, 328 Ash Street, and I live on the north side. I think it's north anyway. I live on the other side of 192. So traffic-wise, for us to come out, we got to make a right-hand turn, and then to make a U-turn to get to Winn-Dixie, we got to get in that left-hand turn lane. Suicide mission to make a left-hand turn to get over. Quick, Margie. Right. So, and then sometimes the suicide mission is you're out there making a left-hand turn and another guy will come up and he'll come this way because he wants to go straight down Seminole. Right. But then you got these other guys coming this way at you wanting to go left to 95. But then you got this other left-hand turn coming, what's the ocean, east? So then east. you got this other left-hand turn going east. So you got all these people in this one little section there that all connects to Seminole. And it's... It's just so dangerous. And then sometimes I try to cross it on a bicycle. And I'm not the homeless people. I'm sure you all see me out there. So anyway, uh, so my question is, you know, you're a th you have authority here, right? I mean, your vote no, is... No, we don't. But, but you could vote no tonight, right? And not go to the commission? Or well, still go to, to the commission? Just to reiterate, we're just an advisory board. Oh, okay. The county commissioners are the ones that's going to say yay it. or nay. All right. Okay. So we still got to go complain again. Yes. All right. Yes. All right, then. Well, hey. And that's why I was trying to <laughs> cut it down so y'all would hit them instead of us. Well, you know, we, want, we just want to make sure, you know, we don't get angry with you guys. Well, we I need to know where you stand and then. It's very sure. obvious. Everyone okay. in here is opposed. Yeah. Okay. So everyone, I encourage every one of you to go to the county commissioner's meeting. Okay. Because what we say just give them doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, All right. Well, I'm going to end. I'm going to say good night and thank you. All right. Thank you. I see we're down to one lady. Is anyone else over? Anyone else want to speak for or against? Well, I'm not even going to say for. <laughs> anyone else want to speak against this? So we have one lady left. Okay. You can take all the time you want. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I guess I'm just talking to myself. Let's call this a practice run. So, um, see the little white area? I pulled up City of West Melbourne future zoning picture because I wanted to just show how significant this small little area is. Um, I like the questions you guys have been asking and I feel like you do have the neighborhood and residents as priority. That being said, I'd like some extra thought and consideration for this project. This project is in a special location. Look, we're bordered by three on three sides. Ma'am, I'm city. sorry. I, did you state your name and address? No, I didn't. I failed already. Okay, okay. Michelle Harvell, 303 Ash Street. But we're bordered by three sides of the city of West Melbourne. So they have their own growth, and we're already a f feeling the effects of that in all of our public works traffic everything um, I've heard that in 2021 the amount of new build permits submitted to you guys is the amount of the last five years combined and that's huge um, there's a Brevard County comprehensive plan that is written for decades I feel like we just need to stop and evaluate the impact that we've had already um, the strain and growth of significance has already had an effect on our schools, public works, and has not, public works has not caught up already as we have no lights in front of Sam's and had three fatalities in the last six months. As far as experience goes for all of us, none of us have had the experience of this kind of growth yet. This is beyond all of our experience. The RCL company study that Kim provided was, covers an area that is, not in, is more than what's in question today. And I don't think it takes into consideration the growth of the last year and the new build permits. Um, the website for the proposed project says that there is a plethora of high-paying tech jobs. 
Well, there's a plethora of other available sites for this project as well. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, if the property has been vacant a very long time, I never saw any for sale signs. Um, there's lots of options for that for Mr. Kane. Um, the intent is never to harm, and we understand that. It is to make money, but we need to stop before the harm is done. And thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name you? is my name is Linda Fernandez, and I live at 4450 Miami Avenue. And drainage has been discussed a couple times, yes. but not this particular issue. I live at the far west end of Miami, which is the total opposite end of where they want the apartment buildings to go into. We're at, the west end is dead end. You can't get out of our neighborhood through the end of Miami. When there is flooding, and they are trapped within June Park because they can't get out, new residents or people trying to come in off of 192 because of flooding they assume they can get out of our neighborhood at the west end of miami they come down to miami which on the last house they realize it's a dead end they try to make a u-turn to get head east on miami well there's a big ditch right across the street from us which is flooded floods the road people across the street, half up on our property. You can't see there was a ditch there. These new residents or people coming off of 192, they end up in the ditch right across from our house. My husband and I had helped several people because you cannot see the ditch. Now you have all these people in the apartment complex and when all that gets flooded down there and they think they're gonna get out on the 192 at the west end of Miami, that isn't happening then they will end up in the ditch as well right. because they don't realize there's a ditch there because it's all flooded completely over. So I would say that's quite dangerous. Okay. And even though you said I had all the time I wanted, <laughs> I will end here. All Thank right. <laughs> Should we clap now? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else to speak against this item? Okay, seeing that, Miss Kim, if you could come back up. Board, do we have any questions for her? I do not. Well, they were talking, so it's time for us to talk now. <laughs> I do have a brief rebuttal. Okay, you have the floor. Thank you. Just going through the comments, uh, again, um, this She's is... She's the applicant. She gets to speak. This is not... A, multifamily is not always considered commercial. Multifamily is considered residential. So it's residential against residential. It's the edge of their neighborhood, edge of their community, and it's in trending commercial area. Um, the conditions of this area have changed since 1999. Uh, and I'm just doing this in order. School concurrency is not an issue. You have that study in your, in your packet. This is not a site plan review. You all are very aware right. that we need to show the justification for the change of the land use and the change of the zoning. So the flood study that's been referenced a couple of times is at site plan review. And you're all very aware that the county code requires to retain the drainage. And so drainage now just flows anywhere it wants. When this is built, drainage has to stay on there and the county ensures that through site plan review. Uh, regarding the compatibility, it is single family to sing, it's, it's multifamily to single family. It's a transitional zoning as Mr. McKnight said. Also, too, by increasing the buffers and having fencing and things like that, that's what increases the compatibility. That's why you generally have single-family, multi-family, commercial for transitional zoning. Uh, re regarding Seminole Road, again, that is a site plan issue. And as Mr. Minibu knows, the county can make us 
pave roads, increase roads, put sidewalks, put storm drains, put shoulders, and whatever the county is going to require, and the county requires it not only for our development, but for future developments, that will be done at site plan. Uh, the traffic counts were done. This wasn't just a, this is what studies say. Mr. Um, Taylor's company actually did traffic counts, and that's in the traffic analysis that's been submitted to the county. So that took into account the Amazon deliveries, the, uh, the school that's there, which that's a whole other issue, that school, they should be accountable for their own traffic. But the traffic study done by uh, Kim Lee Horn did indeed account for the traffic that is existent now using all the policies that required by the methodology from the county. Uh, utilities, this is in the West Melbourne service area and they have capacity, therefore as a utility they must allow sewer. How the um, developer gets there is going to be up to the engineering and that will be done because sewer would have to be used for an apartment complex or anything over, anything uh, more than a quarter acre lots. This is residential to the south of here and to the west and to the east, but it's all commercial to the north, and this is a transitional zoning. In fact, changing this 4.35 acres is a down zoning, and averaging all of the use over that 12.59 acres is a down zoning. Uh, this is an infill development. I know people always are concerned about precedent, but each zoning and land use is on its own. And this is an infill development. It's a vacant piece of property that's been there a long time. So this doesn't have precedential value unless they're doing the exact same thing with the exact same neighbors with the exact same comments. So precedential value is not happening here. Um, regarding the three stories Ms. Ms. Croft is worried about, and we understand that, that's why we moved the buildings in from her property. She is to the east of the property. Um, the three stories is the same as what a single family home could be at. And is again, five feet or 20 feet from the property line where this is much greater. Um, there's been a lot of um, speculation regarding the apartment values, bring down values around it, that they don't maintain them, they don't upkeep them. That's all speculation. Again, it's not appropriate for zoning or future land use consideration. Um, regarding the sweet deal, um, no one I don't think is aware of this, but this property is $6 million. It's $476,500 per acre. It's not a sweet deal, and no one can put single family for that value there. Regarding lighting, this will be shielded lighting, as Mr. Moya stated, the, the lighting can't spill onto neighboring properties by the county code. Uh, regarding the market study, it did indeed take in everything in the pipeline. Um, and regarding the administrative policies cited um, generally by everyone but specifically by no one, uh, the biggest issue is the compatibility of, of, of administrative policy three, and that deals with uses, which is residential, and says hours of operation, which is residential, lighting, odor, noise levels, all by your performance standards of your code. Um, traffic has been discussed, 20 trips down, down that road. There's no evidence otherwise. The biggest thing here is policy 3D, whether the proposed use would result in a material violation of relevant policies in any element of the comprehensive plan. This is the only place the staff made an opinion and they said no material violation of relevant policies have been identified. So this is not in violation of any comp plan policy. Uh, there's no evidence there'll be adopted levels of service will be compromised. The only evidence you have is a traffic study that says it will not. Um, therefore, we believe that we have met the burden of showing consistency with the comprehensive plan, consistency with your land development regulations, and the need and reasons for the change. And we would ask that you approve the requested small scale amendment, the requested rezoning, and removal of the BDP, which again, we're going to find a surveyor to, to label that out because it's not clear because it's only on four acres and we're not sure exactly where that is. Sure I've got two, two experts over here telling me different areas of where that, for, where, the, where that finding development plan impacts. So with any questions, I will sit down. What was your question, Joe? No, it was just, did they do a title search? Wouldn't it show up on that? It's going to take a survey. It'll take a survey. It's going to take a surveyor. Kim, uh, just real quick, when you do in, uh, the traffic study, you use the potential highest use 
of the commercial property, correct? That's what was done, that, that, that handout that was given you. And what, is that a, I'm trying to think B1, is that a grocery store or? Pawn shop, drug store, liquor store, convenience store, gas station. <clears throat> Probably more than one. Yeah, so there's a catch-all rate in that ITE handbook that we talked about earlier where you generate the trip rates for. It's a catch-all for all uh, retail shopping centers. So they've, they've done a lot of empirical data collection from many different shopping centers of different sizes, and the category by size that this fell into is between 150 and 200,000 uh, square feet. So that trip rate... Um, by way of, an, uh, of a fitted curve equation is what we used for um, generating the trips that could be generated at the site. But it's <clears throat> possible Audience, that please. it's more. Everyone's, we've than, all listened to everyone else, so it's their turn to talk. Nobody else, please. It's very they, have, po they have a chance for a rebuttal. It's very possible that what you used in your proposal is much higher than what would go there. Correct. Because That's it's what the, the maximum it's the allowable max. is. Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll continue if you want. Continue. All right. So, um, for the record, this is not something I will be in favor of. I do not see it being compatible. It's far too dense for the area with your roosters and your cows and and your new coyote friends, but um, build the BU1 on the front, in my opinion, but the back should can, should remain RU17. <clears throat> I would actually be, with the amount of people that showed up today, good on you, I would be disappointed to see this board push this through. Um, let me see. Roads, drainage, traffic, sewer, simply doesn't matter. It's just not a compatible use for this land. and. It's ironic that we had that BDP item come up today um, because we should uphold those BDPs, in my opinion. So I don't know if we're entertaining motions or if we want to let the board continue to chat, but I will make a motion. Well, let's hold that and right. table for discussion. Does it, anyone else on the board have anything for Kim? Or um, <clears throat> Yes, Chairman. I, would, I do have something to say. Um, the BDP, as it is ironic, that we brought this up and one of our steam board members John here has pointed out very eloquently that they were brought those BDPs the, the binding developer uh, plan was brought in because a community like you have come in and said we don't like this particular even though it is legal even though it is acceptable even if it meets all of the technical criteria it, it's not compatible. And so if you're going to have these binding agreements, you can't wipe them away 10 years down the road because the zoning changed on a technicality. So I want to compliment John for uh, bringing it up. Uh, it is ironic that this was brought up here at this time period. Um, I do believe that there should be an extension on the 120 days uh, for extenuating circumstances. But the BDP, the original low residency, um, was put there for a reason a number of years ago. So it has to be respected. It's binding. That's the word, B. The other aspect is it compatibility. Are we going to be increasing 130 units over what's currently available? Um, that's not compatible. And it may be compatible within the technical confines of what we're saying is a former or a current plan versus what a future plan is, but nobody can accurately re, uh, you know, do the future. We're listening to people here who third generation, third generation moved here and they're moving back. Now it's a very powerful statement that each and every one of you have made today. So I am not in favor of either removing the old BD BDPs or uh, moving forward with the reclassification. But I want to compliment you on showing up because nothing gets done unless you show up. <laughs> and then we're an advisory board. We're not the end all. So you got to do it one more time. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. And they know you're coming. <laughs> <laughs>
Mr. Ron, anything for discussion? Uh, yeah, for discussion, uh, the closest Res 15 is north on the other side of New Haven. The immediate area around here is all Res 4. You know, so, and the RU, the existing zoning that's in there is RU 17. Uh, and that's all around. So, it's hard to, for me to call this a transition when you're going from small residential to high density residential to small residential to small res. There's not, it's transition means there's something on the other side. Right. Uh, it's not, you don't put it in the middle of it. Mr. Bryant, any discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Maybe Kim can answer. The BDP applies to both parcels, am I correct? The BDP addresses a four acre parcel somewhere on that, that east parcel, that east eight, acre, uh, or east eight acres. It's not clear where that four acres is or where the lots are that are referenced. The BDP only restricts parking and structures from being on there does not restrict stormwater. So if we can locate where it is, we may be able to put the stormwater plan there and leave it there, leave the BDP. It doesn't restrict it to RU17. That's not what the BDP says. <coughs> it just restricts buildings and parking. If we can figure out where that is, we may be able to work within it. So with the BU1 being out on 192. I, I think that is in the BU1 section, to be honest. I mean, it would make sense, but whether it's on the BU1 or in the back, I think it's important that everybody that's out here today that we hear what you're saying. And look, we've been up here on this board before and we've voted against things and the county commission, surprisingly to us, has voted for it. Um, how much did you say this was selling for? $6 million? Yes, sir. Every one of you, your property values have skyrocketed in the state of Florida. That property's not going down anytime soon in price. Somebody else is going to come along with something to go here. Maybe this isn't it, but my concern is where does that BDP fall? Is it on the BU section or the RU17? Because you all might get something on that BU1 property that you might not like. And I'm not saying that this is the answer, but I would be interested to know where that BDP actually falls on this property. Yes, sir. I agree. As I said, I've got two different opinions over here already, so we're going to get a surveyor to figure it out. Yeah. So Thank in you. theory, you could vote to approve, but not remove the BDP. Mr. John, any discussion? No, I think I've said enough <laughs> about this one. I, I'd like to enforce the BDPs. Mr. Minibu? No, I'm sitting back. <laughs> <laughs> I've said enough tonight, and I've listened well. That's all I can tell you. <clears throat> well, I'm going to need some kind of a motion in a second. Mr. Chair, I move to deny... I'm not, which item is this? I can't eight. remember. Well, eight, we're going to be eight, voting eight. on H8 first. H8. I recommend denial. H8. Second. So we got a motion by Ben and a second by Ron. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Wait a minute. Now all y'all opposed earlier. <laughs> They're quiet now. That's right. That motion passed unanimously. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We want to go eat. Trust me. <laughs> Item H9. Move to deny. Second. That second one's by Robert. We got a motion by Ben on item H9. A second by Robert. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now, before y'all get, get excited, for real, you have to show up, just like Robert was saying, and everyone's saying, we commend you for coming. But you've got to show up at the county commissioners because they're going to approve or deny it. We're just an advisory board. 
So, good luck. All right. So, meeting adjourned. Mark. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.